are here on March 7th, 2023. And I think we will get started. I think everyone's here in person. Um, welcome to today's city council meeting. We continue to host hybrid meetings to keep everyone healthy and safe. Our meetings are public and you're welcome to join us in person or by watching from the council's agenda page, Facebook, YouTube, or SLC TV. We hope you'll continue to join us in whichever manner you feel most comfortable. Today is a work session meeting during which there is no public comment. Please join us tonight during our 7 p.m. formal meeting to share your comments. We, of course, welcome your feedback anytime by mail to P.O. Box 145476, Salt Lake City, Utah, 8411-5476 or by email at council.comments at slcgov.com or via our 24-hour phone comment line, 801-535-7654. Written comments we receive on agenda topics are shared with council members and posted on our website, slccouncil.com. We'll now begin our work session, and the first item on our agenda is item number one, updates from the administration. Before we jump to that, I just want to give a quick update on um, some changes that we're making on the agenda because of... I think someone's availability. We are switching number three and four, the rezone and master plan amendment 854 South 500 East and the ADU amendment follow-up with items eight and nine. So eight and nine will be coming earlier in the agenda and three and four will be coming later in the agenda. So if anyone's tuning in for those specific items, we'll make an, I'll, explain that again when we get to that time in the agenda. But um, three and four are gonna be at the end of the agenda. Eight and nine will be coming in places three and four. So our updates from the administration will be with uh, Weston Clark and Andrew Johnston today. All right, hello council, thank you so much. It's been a while since I've been in here, happy to be back. We'll go ahead and start um, with what we always do uh, for the engagement highlights, and that's on the next slide. Oh, this is nice. This is new. This is great. That's helpful. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I've got my own. <laughs> I always brought in my own computer and did the turn, so this is wonderful. Of course, my notes are here, but um, anyway, our, our webpage, uh, which we love to advertise uh, for community engagement, um, the slc.gov slash feedback page. Uh, next, a couple of really uh, quick updates. Uh, one is through CAN, uh, the housing SLC, the uh, Housing SLC, the new housing plan draft is live. After hearing from more than 4,000 residents, SLC staff has created a plan to address the housing crisis over the next five years. Residents are still invited to share their feedback on the plan's proposed goals, um, which can be accessed on that web page or the feedback page. Um, they can read the entire plan there um, on that page. The public comment period is for 45 days. It started March 2nd and will end April 16th. Staff is advertising the plan on social media through community partner networks and with flyers throughout the neighborhood. Uh, engagement will also take place at upcoming homeless resource fairs. And the planning department, a quick update on the affordable housing incentives, which was supposed to go to the planning commission on the 8th due to the snowstorm, it was bumped to the 22nd. So that's just a FYI. Next slide. And then a quick update on the Virginia Street reconstruction. Uh, the project team has made the final roadway design public alongside an engagement summary report and both are available through the project website which are accessible through this, uh, through the, the feedback page. Transportation will now work with engineering to finalize the design in the coming months and the team will meet with uh, the Greater Avenues Community Council periodically to provide updates and construction will begin uh, spring of 2024. Next slide. And then finally, here are our community office hours, uh, the remaining ones. We've already missed one, unfortunately, for this update, but we have uh, the rest remaining for March. Um, we're getting some regulars uh, spots that seem to be successful. Um, and of course, if you have any suggestions on other places for my team to go to, I'd be happy to send them there. And you're also welcome to send any constituents. They might have any questions for the administration can go and interface with my team at any of these locations and times. Um, they would love to hear from them. That's it. Andrew. Uh, next slide, please. 
Now, the updates for last week for utilization is 91.6%, as you can see. Uh, that's down just slightly, but not much from the previous weeks. Um, I would anticipate those just for the council and prepping you that as we move into springtime now into March and into April and mid-April when the uh, winter overflow plans sort of wind down, um, the operators oftentimes try and move folks into permanent beds as much as possible, which means some nights you'll see uh, lower occupancy rates at times, um, particularly as you get closer into April when instead of running up to April 15th and then having hundreds of people being just turned out, they try and gradually move it through the process in the weeks up to that. So it means you might see the numbers drop a little bit as we get closer to April 15th. Uh, to uh, scheduled... Um, Encampment impact mitigation work or rapid intervention this week, uh, obviously weather dependent, and then 33 um, camps are being tracked by heart right now. And you can see for rapid intervention, there's still nine um, encampments that VOA is going out to regularly, and then uh, nine rehabilitations, and then 15 places that are recurring ones throughout the city. Uh, resource fair this Friday at Fairmont Park. And then Operation Homeless Connect, which is an annual event now, uh, March 24th, I believe. And we'll have more information for you coming up on that. Next slide. Many of you uh, tracked during the session um, bills that were related to homelessness or housing. Uh, the major one was 499 uh, in the House. And this is a really general sort of uh, summary of what came out of that for those of you who are not following it very closely or interested. Um, the State Homelessness Mitigation Fund, which was set up to uh, provide uh, financial resources for cities that host resource centers, was increased by about $5 million per year through a mixture of uh, cities in the state paying into it and the state matching those funds. Uh, we anticipate that we'll get uh, probably another million dollars in addition to what we normally get through the formula um, because of that this year. And we'll have some numbers for you uh, hopefully in the following weeks. Uh, however, it does also require the city to have an, and enforce no camping ordinances when there are um, when there are beds available in emergency shelter. Um, that's a key piece because a lot of the definitions in this bill have to go through rules um, at the state Legi uh, state office of homelessness services in the following um, probably two months to define what that means. Okay, um, so I want to put that out there and make sure that hasn't changed. We had that in the previous version of this, and it still uh, moves forward. Andrew, this says requires enforcement of no camping ordinance when no emergency shelter beds are available. So regardless of whether they're available or not, we do not get our funding unless that is. It's been one of the conditions of receiving state homelessness mitigation funds. So cities that receive those funds um, have to commit to that. Uh, the mechanism might change slightly this year in how I report that. In the past years, we've reported it through our application every year for the money. Um, that may be changed based on the language in the bill, but that's still there just so you're aware of it. So, um, so how do we report that we do enforce? Generally, in previous years, they've asked us if we have an ordinance, number one. And number two, how are you enforcing it? Okay. And so we just type and say, this is what we do? Yes. Okay. All yes. Right. Um, I'm not aware of any other uh, auditing entity on that particular piece. Um, but I'm, things always change in the future. But I want to make sure that's clear to everybody as well. The Winter Response Task Force is what we called the COM process last year, the Conference of Mayors. Um, it's changed slightly this year with some new dates. So the end of March is when the state needs to know what the money they have to fund it. Uh, there needs to be a number of beds for the goal for next winter, and then the scope of the plan requirement. So what the plan should entail that's going to be come forward by a lot of mayors in the county. Um, that'll be pretty short, like I said, a few weeks from now, and then it moves up the uh, submission date to August 1st instead of September 1st, uh, when a plan needs to be submitted to the state to review. The other piece in there is, and there's a lot of details obviously in this we can get to later on, um, but there's a new code blue protocol. I know the council has been interested in a code blue concept where if the temperature drops too low to a certain point, that there are certain emergency measures that can be taken on a local level. Um, the state, uh, through this legislation, has now determined that the state Depar uh, Department of Health and Human Services would evaluate that on a county by county basis and issue a code blue order if it, if it hit 15 degrees Fahrenheit or below. And there's some leeway in there for other weather conditions like precipitation and things as well. This still have to be worked out, obviously. Um, but that would then do certain things um, 
allow increased capacity of the resource centers themselves, kind of like we had this year, up to about the same amount we have this year with the mayor's uh, emergency orders. Um, it would also um, um, require them to take in individuals as long as they didn't um, exceed that threshold. So even if their staffing wasn't high enough or other things, I think it also has some language in there. Um, and then there's a lot of details to be worked out about um, requirements for when uh, camps could be um, cleaned and those kind of things around those declarations. But just so you're aware, that is in state code now, and there's going to be a lot of work on both the state and local levels for us and the coalition and the counties to figure out what that means and how that gets implemented. So we'll have more um, coming forward for you all. A third piece that's new this year. Oh. May I? Oh. Yes. Yep. Councilman Fowler, go ahead. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I should have been paying more attention to this during the session, but I tried to block the session out. Um, but is there any money given to municipalities when a code blue order is put into place and uh, either cities or counties need to open other facilities, hopefully counties and some of our, as we did um, this year of any 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 funding? <laughs> uh, yes, council member. The I put it under the winter response task force because that task force is also going to take on not just overflow but also the code blue piece. So they're going to have to take all of that together with the numbers and the budget that the state will come up with. Will should include that as well. So there's a lot of work to be done in that area. Um, I will also say that uh, Wayne Niederhauser and the State Office of Homelessness Services worked with a lot of people in the legislature and secured quite a bit of funding this year, um, both operational funding for homeless services across the state, which is uh, new and helpful, um, and as well as housing monies. So a very good job. Um, the last piece on the slide is that in addition to these other pieces, what's also new is uh, there's a provision in here that starting not this coming winter, but the following winter, um, Davis and Utah counties by their size would be required to have their own winter response task force and come up with plans um, for their areas, um, which is new. Now, there have been plans in other parts of the state before, but not necessarily formally in code like this. So we just lost the screen. Um, so that is new, and I think that's an important piece that broadens out responsibility to multiple counties um, and would ultimately help all of us, we believe. Uh, that is the end of the slide, council members. Are there more questions, Mr. Chair? Council members, any questions? It doesn't look like it. Thank you, Andrew. Sure. Thank you, Weston. Okay, so we're going to move on to item two. Item two is our informational equity update. Uh, again, from the mayor's administration. Uh, we have Chris Macias, language access coordinator, and Damien Choi. Did I get that right? Okay. <laughs> the chief equity officer here. Hello, thank you for having us. Uh, my name is Chris Macias, as mentioned. I'm the new language access coordinator in the mayor's office here for the city, accompanied by the chief equity officer, Damien Choi. Uh, mainly playing a supporting role today, but I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> so I want to provide a quick introduction, first of all, and, and a brief update on to what it is the work we're doing in terms of language access. Uh, language access, of course, refers to providing uh, services for those departments that are public facing within this, the city of Salt Lake uh, for residents, citizens to. Mr. Chair, um, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. Can you bring the microphone a little closer? I is this better? Yes, okay, thank, thank you. you. <clears throat> Slow down. Yes, I can. <laughs> I, I tend to speak like that normally, so I apologize. Um, yes, so I was saying uh, language access services refers to providing accessible uh, <clears throat> services for those who speak a different language or are limited English proficient um, and for all departments who are public facing. So my job is to ensure that um, the city itself is compliant in, in following the policy around language access, which has officially been approved um, as of September of 2022. Uh, the language access Im implementation plan is the next phase, which is currently in the works uh, on the final phase as we speak. Um, it should be implemented and, and trainings will begin uh, very shortly. So 
I'm in charge of seeing that all of that is happening, uh, making sure that there is training for interpretation services, for translations, for over-the-phone interpretation, uh, whenever there are events uh, where the mayor is speaking or when our offices are being represented, that there is some sort of service available. Of course, uh, we've designated the language of Spanish to be a priority language, so most of our vital documents, which I'll get into in just a moment, will be translated into Spanish, and then we have uh, further, further than that, four more languages that we feel are necessary for different communities that can also be translated upon request, but also as needed depending on the event or the circumstances. Um, we are... What are the four additional languages? Yes, um, I, I have that, but I wanted to make sure that I refer to everything. Being that this is my first update, just in case I was nervous, which I am, so... <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. Oh, of course. I, I, sp speaking to a lot of you in person uh, beforehand makes me less nervous, but thank you. Um, so, of course, I mentioned Spanish. We have a lot of uh, Chinese, Mandarin, and Cantonese languages that are um, uh, predominant as well. Um, a lot of Vietnamese, Arabic, uh, Korean, um, and a few other uh, South Asian languages, including like Nepalese, Karenic, etc. So, those are the other languages that we're definitely focusing on. Certain communities, we also look at Tongan and Samoan, um, especially in the west side of Salt Lake City. So. Those are kind of the top 10, but we do have focus on the top four more so, as I mentioned. So thank you for that question. Thank you. Um, so the, the next phase is identifying key departments. Uh, Damon and myself have identified our public lands department, our public utilities, and our justice courts as departments that will be prioritized for training, given that most uh, individuals go to them first for services. All of them can come to us or can come to me for any kind of service, but those are the ones that we'll be focusing on the most in terms of making sure that they are compliant and follow, following all policy. Um, one of the main things that we're working on is identifying what vital documents means, and vital documents refers to any document that is, of course, public facing, as I mentioned, but also, I just apologize, let me look at my notes here. Um, anything that's, for example, an emergency declaration, uh, anything that's a notification of hazard, any property closures, letters that are notices of reduction of services, denial or termination of services, uh, anything that is time sensitive, including, including deadlines, hearings, investigations, litigations, etc. And we've also identified the city and county building as a um, uh, priority building itself, so all signage here should also be in Spanish and then as needed by the other languages that I mentioned as well. Um, so Vital Documents has been kind of the the biggest part that we focused on recently so that we know what needs to go out. Recently there's been quite a few press releases uh, going out on behalf of the mayor's office and we've been working really hard to translate those and what comes after the press release as well. For example, signage being posted in certain communities, certain neighborhoods, most of that um, has been translated into, at minimum, Spanish. Um, <clears throat> yeah, um, in, we're also working with some of the outgoing communication services, such as uh, the Select City mobile app or emergency services that are out there to see what kind of things can be linked back to our website and what can also be translated. Currently, we have the Google Translate embedded into all SLC Gov pages, which works. However, um, because it's an automated system, it does not always translate accurately. So we're working on getting everything more, um, viewing it more detailed so that we can have equitable uh, language services there. And of course, lastly, for my points is we're working on how we're going to track all of this. Um, not only do we have spreadsheets upon spreadsheets of tracking services, but we work closely with a lot of the vendors that we have contracted for all of the language services to ensure that their systems are accurate so that ours reflect what they have as well. And we're on budget um, and we're being efficient and we can report that at the end of the year. And all of the departments that I mentioned earlier will have specific training on how to track that. I will be compiling a list to present to all of you as well as um, everybody on our side in the mayor's office. So very brief overview of uh, my role, along with the support of my team. Um, I can open it up to any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Uh, council members, any questions? Mr. Chair. Yep, go ahead, Council Member, please. Uh, so uh, I, I've been pushing on this issue, and you know, I know that I, I remember running in 2020, I felt like a long time ago, and too soon at the same time, uh, 2021. Uh, and I met with uh, someone from the administration that told me we're working on it and it's happening and it's happening fast and here we are and uh, I mean there's a lot of work to be done and I'm not underestimating how much work that is. I really <laughs> understand that this is, 
we're moving a ship, right? It's a big ship, and there's a lot of documents, and there's a lot of processes. And what uh, what are the goals uh, as far as like what are the the date goals that we that your department is setting up for this? I just want to know um, a little more specific. What do you see, uh, you know, by the end of the year done? And uh, or you know, like do you have other mid goals in there? I just want to find out if you are staffed correctly, uh, because this is a priority. And again, I've been hearing it for years now, literally years. And uh, I'm hoping that we, sh we do definitions, but we actually get to translating documents faster than creating definitions, which are important, and we need to get them done. But um, to me, maybe it seems like we are understaffed to get this goal done faster. Um, so that's what I'm, my question, I guess, is, uh, what do you see accomplishing by the end of the year, and maybe do you anticipate to need more people? I feel like we can always use more support, of course. Um, but some of the main goals that we have for now is to have not only the key departments, but as many of them to have the training that we're currently putting together, which again includes not only how to request services, including interpretation and translation, but also how to report and do that. Um, the second part is we have also been designated as a Title VI coordinator, which is the uh, non-discrimination based on uh, the, the different classes that we have, right? Um, age, sex, national origin, uh, and the others for slipping my mind at the moment. But in national origin, we also include language. Um, and so if somebody is discriminated against because of how they speak or because of their limited English proficiency, we will have a process of how to file a, a complaint or a discrimination um, complaint around that. So that is something that is in the works. I'm working with the city attorney's office to, to do that. Um, we actually have some... Uh, complaints have come our way already um, that because there isn't a solidified process, they're kind of doing it case by case, but we want to make sure that that is uh, streamlined as much as possible. So definitely by the end of the year, that will be completed. I'm hoping in the next six months that's completed. Um, but also that there is signage posted clearly, um, including hopefully in this room. <laughs> uh, I speak documents, flag documents, so that folks who come um, know how to receive those services. And it becomes more of a general process in the beginning where departments, if they're planning, for example, events or they're planning a meeting, that from the get-go they say, has this been uh, made ac accessible in the languages that we are presenting in? And so that hopefully will become what, what we're tr starting to call it transcreation, which means not only are we creating documents in English, but at the same time we're creating those in Spanish and or other languages. Th thank you, Chris. Council members, any other questions? We appreciate that. I think we all share the goal of having equity um, throughout our city and making sure that everyone has equal access to government regardless of their background. So thank you for this work. Um, and let us know how we can support you. Perfect. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Um, and again, for the public, we are moving items number three and four, the rezone at 865 South 5th East and the ADU text amendment follow-up discussion to later on in the agenda, replacing items eight and nine. So that will be roughly 525 if we stay on time, which we never do. Um, but we will now jump to items eight and nine. So the next item will be a uh, resolution for $3.5 million of one-time home ARPA grant funding. And at the table, we'll have Ben Ludke, who I believe is joining virtually, um, Council of Policy Analyst, Tammy Hunsaker, Deputy, Deputy Director of Community and Neighborhoods, Tony Milner, the Director of the Hand Division, and Heather Royale, Deputy Director of Housing and Neighborhood Development. Ben, if you'll give a brief introduction. Thanks, Mr. Chair. The administration transmitted a proposed final draft of the allocation plan for the council's consideration. The plan tells HUD, the US Housing and Urban Development Department, how the city will use these one-time three and a half million dollar of funds. They must benefit low to moderate income residents in qualifying populations. The final draft is different than what the council saw in October under a previous draft. And the changes incorporate the council's policy feedback as well as community input. Uh, Scott, can you please display the table on page one of the staff report?
Not this one. Uh, that's the next briefing. Should be under home ARPA. While Scott's finding that, I'll describe the table. It is on page one of the staff report. And the council's feedback last October was to prioritize rental assistance and creating deeply affordable rental housing with an emphasis on family-sized housing, three or more bedrooms, and mixed income developments. The new proposal splits $3 million evenly between the two categories. So one and a half million for tenant-based rental assistance and the other one and a half million for creating deeply affordable rental housing. The $3 million would go through an open and competitive application process, review and funding recommendations by an advisory board and the mayor, and then the council would make the final funding decisions. There's also $529,000, which is allowed for the cost of administering the program. The council may remember approving a portion of that 529,000 in a budget amendment in a previous fiscal year, and that paid for the planning and the community assessment efforts that are included in the allocation plan required by HUD. A uh, note on the supportive services category, it does allow rent assistance, but it's one of many eligible activities within that broad category. Some council members expressed a preference for tenant-based rental assistance, which is its own category, instead of supportive services. Funding tenant-based rental assistance would remove the rental assistance from competing with the many activities allowed in the broad category of supportive services. There's a table in attachment two comparing rental assistance between these two categories. There are some differences. For example, tenant-based rental assistance has a minimum lease term of 12 months, but rental assistance under supportive services has no minimum lease term. So if the council wanted to look at those differences, we can display the table, but it's there for your reference either way. As a reminder, HUD set a deadline of March 31st for submitting the city's allocation plan and amending the 2021-2022 annual action plan. That year is when the funds were first announced and we need to update the plan when the funds were announced instead of this year's annual action plan. That's it for my overview. I'll turn it over to Tammy and her team. Thank you, Ben. Thanks, Hi, Ben. I think Ben covered all of the changes and the updates and the deadlines thoroughly, so we're just here to answer questions that the council may have. Um, council members? Council Member Dugan? Yeah, thanks. Appreciate the uh, discussion here. On, on the $3 million, we, we split it in half. 1.5 for rental assistance, one for, for development of deeply affordable housing. Was there a how that how did that decision be made? Because I keep I, I sometimes think we have a lot of money going to uh, development of deeply affordable housing or housing in general, uh, and there's a lot of different places to get that money, but maybe we don't have as much money for the rental assistance that could be used across the board. And I was just wondering uh, the discussion or decision making of just making it 1.5 each, or should it be 70 30. 3070 or some other differential because a rental assistance seems to be needed across the board and for probably a longer period of time uh, than the deeply affordable because we have a lot of other funding mechanisms for that. Just curious. 
Yeah, there was a, a needs assessment done as part of um, the planning process for these funds, and that assessment did indicate that new units of deeply affordable housing are needed, particularly, particularly to serve the uh, persons experiencing homelessness population. And so originally when we brought the plan to you, we had most of the money in the new development category. But based on feedback from the council, um, you did want to see more funds for rental assistance. So we incorporated that feedback. And rental assistance does help with the needs assessment that was done. Um, as part of this planning process, it addresses that needs assessment in that providing rental assistance prevents further individuals from potentially following, falling into homelessness. So we felt like a good split was 50-50 between development and rental assistance, but we're happy to make further adjustments on the council's feedback. No, I appreciate that. That's, that's why I just wanted to make sure we, it was thought out. I thought that I appreciate the way the process that was done, and, and uh, I think it's fine with the way it is, but now I was just wondering about the, is there need, more need on one end or the other end, but I think the 50-50 is probably quite right right now. Thank okay. you. Thanks, Councilman Dugan. I have a question. <clears throat> on the development of affordable rental housing, it says that we have, and I assume we're still continuing to prioritize family-sized housing and mixed income development, but can you tell me how that prioritization or emphasis will take place is that a threshold requirement, or will it be just one of many considerations? How will we prioritize those? I don't think we've worked out those details yet, but we would uh, probably follow the RDA's lead with establishing threshold requirements and priorities. So if the council has particular input on what those thresholds and priorities should be, we can definitely incorporate that into the NOFA process. Okay, great. I, I think my only f input would be, I, I think that the prioritization that we did with the RDA was correct, and I, I, I think that's a good model to follow. Um, but I would, the one thing that happened in the RDA was that in the NOFA process, there was an additional sort of threshold requirement that the committee put on, which was whether or not they have LIHTC funding. Um, and I would, for my purposes, say not to do that. Just go with the priorities that we had already discussed as a, as a board. And I know we're gonna be discussing those again next week. Uh, yes. Um, on, on the um, development of the affordable housing, making it a competitive process makes sense. On the tenant-based rental assistance side, are we gonna be running that as a competitive grant or is it just going to be a qualification grant where if people meet whatever qualifications, they're eligible for that assistance. Yeah, so that would be put out through a competitive application for nonprofit community partners to apply for and then administer. For them to distribute, okay. And then we'd help them with the policy procedures for the guidelines. So we're not going directly to the tenants, we're going to an intermediary, okay. Thank you. That answer your question. Any other questions on this, council members? Okay. Excellent. Um, let's see, what is our schedule for this? Today was the hearing. Public comment will be happening in two weeks on February 21st with tentative action to February. What? We already heard public comment. Correct. And today is a follow-up briefing, and then we may take action on Tuesday, March 21st. Is that correct? Thanks, Ben. Mr. Chair, I do have a question. It just okay. came to my mind. Sorry. Go ahead. Um, We're not done yet. Okay. Um, sorry. Yeah. So, we've. I feel like we've been supporting um, deeply affordable housing for years now, and the six million dollars we just to put for these three projects. And I'm wondering. Um, and you say, well, there was a study, and it says that we still need more deeply affordable housing. But I also feel like constituency or the word in the street is saying, hey, you're doing a lot of this, and there's this gap of people, maybe middle class, that still cannot afford anything in Salt Lake City. So they still, you know, they're being displaced as well as the folks that do need the deep affordable housing. So are we doing this because we have this timeline for HUD, like we need to get this money out. I can't remember if this is the money that we need to, to use or when are we going to have the discussion or when are we going to also help another segment of the population of our, 
constituency that needs housing in Salt Lake City but cannot afford that. It's just they're out. They're out of the, that spectrum. Like they're in the middle. Like either you are mm -hmm. very rich and you can afford anything or you're in this part um, that the government helps. Like we're all trying and we have three projects going on plus two more or whatever. But those that are not like the ones that are, don't qualify for anything. Like they're not rich and they are not in that AMI threshold. Like that, that is a great question. I'll, I'll turn it over to these guys to um, talk about the home ARP requirements in more detail. But it's kind of the target of this specific of this funding. Specific funding. Um, along with the needs assessment that created our focus area with this specific population, but that is a great question, council member, with the coordination with other AMIs. And I think we'll be getting into more housing discussions in future okay. meetings. And in terms of the timeliness requirement, there will be timeliness with these funds, but it's not the same as what we were talking about two weeks ago. Okay. So the okay. specific... Thank you. Yeah, just in a quick nutshell, is basically that HUD made sure that these went to qualifying populations who were experiencing homelessness or close to being homeless. Okay. Basically, anyone, uh, victims of domestic violence, veterans, currently homeless, or uh, soon to be homeless. And so the, the plan, everything that we do has to kind of make sure that we're focusing and directing funds towards those qualifying populations. All right. Thanks. Sorry. Thanks for the clarification. Now I've got back to, I understand that. Thanks. Mr. Chair, I'm sorry. I Council actually member, do have Council a member Fowler, go ahead. comment on this. Okay, Fowler, then Puy. Um, So going back to the 1.54 deeply affordable rental housing, I feel that, and I feel like I sound like a broken record, but um, oh well, um, I feel that we could actually leverage that 1.5 million by utilizing the tools that we already have for development within the RDA. So I'm not, and, and to mention like, oh, we'll just, we'll just look at the policies over on that side, which is great because we've worked really hard on those policies and, and that no fun looking at the application process there. Um, it, it, it again feels like we're just continuing to have two separate hands doing the same thing that I've sort of been pushing against because I think that there are skills in in each department that sort of get uh, it's like being duplicated for no reason right so if we're doing the development and we know that we have this one we have tools that I think we could leverage this 1.5 million with those tools why are we not just giving that 1.5 million over into the next NOFA round in the RDA? And I, I imagine, and you can, is that some of this will be that there's all sorts of rules with HUD, but I feel like we're, we, could, we could still follow those rules, but again, still leverage the money so we're getting more, for the, more bang for our buck. Yeah, we as an administration haven't worked out the details, but that was definitely one of the options that we're considering, just packaging this funding with the next RDA NOFA. We definitely need to coordinate that process with the RDA. Um, it would probably have to look like a special set aside because I don't know if these goals and requirements will align with the goals you will be adopting on the RDA side. So these... Um, per the home ARP rules have to go to persons experiencing homelessness or at risk of homelessness. So the AMI requirement is rather low. So there could be like an, a one big NOFA with a set aside for this population with these requirements and then another pot of money with the requirements that you'll be adopting on the RDA side. That could be a possibility. I, th I, I appreciate that. I would want to say that since I've been on the council and part of the RDA board, people experiencing homelessness and deeply affordable has always been one of our main goals. And we continue, I mean, I can, we just did the spark groundbreaking, the two, five, I mean, we continue to fund those deeply affordable and those projects that provide and create deeply affordable. Um, I personally don't see that changing as one of my priorities, whether it be a council person or a board member. Um, and so, again, I just feel that there is 
a way to streamline things. We already have a process in place. This is what I've been talking about for six years now. And why are we expending talent and time and energy to, to redo the process in two different departments and in two different areas? Um, and and I, again, I appreciate an explanation on that and trying to figure that out and hopefully that coordination will happen because again i think that the rental assistance part that is where i want you to focus the development part like let's give that to to people who are doing that so thank you i'm going to leave it at that may i just add Go ahead, Cindy. to respond to that um the a couple of things. Number one, I know that the administration is having an ongoing conversation about this, and there are some things they're looking at splitting. Um, so it hasn't been lost on them, I don't think. And then um, the other thing is you can influence it significantly by where you appropriate the money. So that would be a budget thing when you get to that point. Councilor Puy. I mean, I'm learning a lot about, you know, funding our future and how, you know, these programs uh, and uh, I was reading the staff questions and some of the funding, uh, some of the funding that is out there uh, from th these different pockets or, or, or buckets of money. Um, and uh, the staff question points out to, um, to coordination between these two different uh, funding mechanisms that people can apply to, that sometimes they can apply for the same projects uh, and uh, some coordination between these two funds uh, or trying to you know, understand how this works better, at least for me. Uh, but the, the coordination between the funding of future housing programs and, the, and had this HUD money here. And um, I would like to refer to that question on, on the staff report. Um, and uh, because I would like to to see how we can make it easier for everybody, and you know, and easier for staff too, because we might be duplicating processes. Um, I understand that HUD has, I mean, all of those funds usually have requirements and processes, but um, trying to minimize the duplicity of of, of work, um, I'm, I'm sure that's the goal of everybody. Um, so yeah, I would like to get clarification get clarification on that for the future. Councilor Pui, can you? Specify which policy question. Is it in, is it one of the listed ones? Yes, seven. Board? Seven. Um, just a response to that. We agree, and we've already internally flagged that, looking at the review and approval process for all of the programs throughout housing stability to streamline those and to make them consistent. So, and that's, okay. Any other questions, council members? All right, I think we'll move on to the next item, which sounds similar, but is a different program. This is item number, listed as item number nine, ordinance regarding local business assistance ARPA grant awards, follow-up discussion. We still have Ben Ludke, council policy analyst here with us, but now we have Lorena Rifo Jensen, Director of our Economic Development Department, Kathy Rigby, Economic Development Project Manager, and Jake Maxwell, Workforce Development Manager. Here at the table. This is a follow-up to a previous discussion we had a couple weeks ago. Ben, do you have an introduction to this? I do, and I'll ask Scott to display the four options since those will come up uh, repeatedly during the briefing. Uh, at the last briefing, the council took a straw poll to support the advisory committee's funding recommendations dependent upon receiving clarification for how phase one applicants that scored 70 or higher would be prioritized in phase two. If anyone needs a copy of the funding log or the list of all the applicants, I'm told there are extra hard copies left. Um, I, I can't see, but I hope they're on the big table in the corner. <laughs> uh, since the briefing, some council members have also reiterated their preference to release more funding now 
than the recommendation of the committee. Economic development provided four options for the council's consideration. These are options A through D, as you can see on the big screen. The council may elect to choose from these four options, but the council is not limited to them. The council has control over the dollar amounts and the uses for the grant awards. As a reminder, the committee's original recommendation, this is option D, is $755,718 for 31 applications. And it's using a sliding scale approach rather than awarding the full eligible amount. And that was done to try and spread the grant awards further and award them to more applicants. I'll turn the time over to Lorena to talk through the other three options a, B, and C. Well, good afternoon. We appreciate you asking us back. And I just wanted to remind you a few little things that I think are critical. Um, please know that our goal has always been to support the business, arts, and artisan community. Therefore, this program was created from the feedback we received from organizations that work with diverse communities, arts, and artisans. Um, equity, diversity, and inclusion have always been part of the core of this program. And as you created the Community Recovery Committee, please know that they also, I have seen their work and they also adhere to these values. So now I will ask Kathy to talk about the options and we're happy to answer any questions you may have. Hello, council members. We have a slide deck and I don't know if somebody can pull that up. It's a brief slide deck, so I'll just start um, our introduction while that's being pulled up. On February 21st, Department of Economic Development presented our Phase 1 Group 1 funding request. At that time, Council requested additional funding options, including expanding the list of applicants to receive funding during this phase. What you see before you, there it is, <laughs> thank you. What you see before you are the three options, and as Ben mentioned, um, we added option D as the original request. So I'll just walk you through these. Option A is what we're calling a hybrid option. Council would approve the original request and add 11 additional applicants to this funding. Um, the scores you see are listed there for those applicants. Um, option A also includes continuing with phase two and an option to include bonus points or not include bonus points is also listed with that. This option would increase funding to just over a million dollars, a million sixteen seven hundred and thirteen dollars. Option B would be the original request and adding bonus points to any applicant who scored 70.0 or above. Council, DED staff, or the Community Recovery Committee could determine the number of points to be awarded. And option C is to award all of the funds now to small business applicants until the $1.5 million is exhausted. This would leave only the $500,000 that's being set aside for the nonprofit subrecipient pass through, um, which will be reviewed once CAN completes their nonprofit application review with the committee. Um, and then, did you have something? No. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> okay. um, just... So, um, in. Basically, option C would just exhaust all of those funds up to that, one, to that point. And then we've listed option D. Um, one thing that um, we had discussed with council staff is that there was a unique situation created um, with the sliding scale. And council member Valdemaros mentioned that this left some odd amounts in the funding request. Um, so staff would propose a rounding up of the awards so that that could be easily administered by not only the Department of Economic Development but the Department of Finance who we've been collaborating with um, and they believe that to be a sound recommendation for how to move forward. So there would be an additional funding option for council to consider and that would be to rounding up. We propose rounding up to the nearest hundred um, to make the, the amounts more easily manageable. So that is it for our presentation. You have those options before you. We're happy to answer any questions. Okay, so D is exactly what we was originally proposed. B is almost the same except for with a bonus 
for any of the first round applicants that scored above 70. Right. That's correct. C is the opposite, which is to exhaust, exhaust all the funds within this first round, and A is a hybrid of the two. More funds in the first round, but still have a second round. That's correct. Right. Mr. Chair, I have Council one question of clarification. Um, it's about one of the applicants. I thought one of the applicants is an actual nonprofit, and I think I can mention it because it's public, right? This, the I think you can, yes. The Chamber of Commerce, is that a, I thought the Chamber of Commerce would be a nonprofit, not a business. Yes. So as we mentioned in our last presentation, if a nonprofit is applying as a small business, meaning they're only looking for revenue recovery for their own business because they were also impacted with loss of funding, through COVID, then they could apply as a small business themselves. This would not be passed through funding. That is what's the topic of the oh, next. Oh, directly for their operations. Got and it. Not necessarily passed through, which if we did $500,000, so if we did option C, then $500,000 would be for nonprofits, but for pass through. Yeah. That's correct. And nonprofits are also business entities. So. Okay. Yes. Thanks. So, so okay. So if the non get some money out yes, and then absolutely. Like, anyway, okay. <laughs> if the nonprofit is using it for their own operations, they would be considered a small business. Right. That's correct. Okay. And the same small business pool, if they are applying for the money as a pass through to other organizations small or small right. businesses. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Council members, we. I mean, I, I have uh, strong feelings about a few things that I want to preserve on this process, uh, regardless of. Um, our general opinions of if we liked it or not, I still feel very strongly about keeping a second phase because there is now 40 some businesses that have applied. Um, and I also don't want to hurt them by just learning about this, which it was the whole purpose of making sure that this was done in two phases, is making sure that people, businesses out there knew and found out about this, and only the most connected businesses to us, maybe, or to the city, will know that these funds exist. So there is an already business out there that are applied. Uh, I don't want to hurt them by creating a bonus scoring for those that apply first but I'm I'm okay with discussing if we need to fund more uh, on the first phase or not that is something that we'll see here but hurting those businesses that are we, we told them that there is a second phase I think that's that's not right um, and giving them a leg up to businesses that, that submitted applications and they didn't uh, follow or they didn't do it right um, we can help them, uh, and a, the the group here in front of us told us last uh, meeting that it wouldn't be hard to get them to reapply. It would be basically a clickable button. Um, so that those are the things that I feel strongly about is keeping a second phase, and and we can deal and deliberate about what to do as far as money for the first phase. But I don't want us to hurt those that are waiting and they just applied. Councilmember Dugan. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, appreciate that, Councilmember Pui. I, I kind of agree. I want the two phases because that was this rule in the beginning, right? We don't want to change the rules of the game <laughs> midstream. And I also agree that uh, the bonus for those who did not uh, meet the uh, threshold for the very first offering, uh, that that bonus is that they are, are, are have already applied once, they've already been interviewed once, and so. Uh, that to me is already their bonus because they already have that application and so by uh, changing the rules and giving them bonus points okay your uh, extra point your field goal and extra point counts for two now because you you missed the first one well that doesn't count right here so let's stick with what we have as a game plan and I'm, I'm just going back to the option d which would be we have a second one we have 39 applicants already in the waiting room at this time so keep the keep the same rules and move on forward with the other additional million dollars. Councilmember Fowler. Thank you. So I have a lot of thoughts on this. Um, first off, I want to say I appreciate that a lot of this new process came about because of our um, our discussion during the the first sort of COVID monies. Right. We we definitely sat here and said, wait a minute, was this process robust enough during those first rounds of COVID monies when we were in the thick of it? 
Um, and, and so I think that this process certainly is better than that first process. And I truly appreciate um, everyone on your team and everyone sitting at the table that said that heard what we were saying and said, OK, let's make this process better. Um, I do think that at that time in 2020, when we were getting monies, it it, you did the best. I also want to say that the, the department did the best that they could because we also knew how quickly we needed to get that money out because there were funding deadlines from the federal government. Um, so all of that is a, a huge kudos to to you, your staff, your predecessor that really yes. um, tried to listen to the council's concerns and, and say, let's make sure that more people are getting a bite at this pie. Yes. Right. Um, mm -hmm. That being said, mm -hmm. I respectfully disagree with uh, Council Member Dugan in that we are changing the rules by adding a second phase. The first phase was already there. The rules were out there. I do think that your team has done an amazing job at making sure that we were hitting more businesses than than the the ones closest to us or that knew people in the city council um, and and with the translation services with the the IT help I, I mean you your team went above and beyond to with the the committee who mm -hmm. has put in hours and hours of work into looking at these applications and and so for me when we came out here and said, here's $2 million, go do it. That was what I was expecting. Okay. And I think that I, because I knew, because we had talked about what the process was going to be and it was like, yes, this is the right process. Mm -hmm. This looks good. Can we improve upon it? Sure. Eventually. Mm -hmm. The next time the federal government gives us $2 million to give to small businesses, we will have learned these lessons. Absolutely. Right. That's um, right. But for me, I, I think that sometimes, well, what, again, what I was expecting is, here's $2 million. Thank you for coming to us and telling us what the process was going to be. Thank you for making sure that our concerns were heard from the last time. Thank you for all of that robust communications that you did with the community members, with small businesses, big, everybody. I mean, I, I truly believe you guys worked your butts off on this. And, and so for... I, I don't think that I was expecting to have to actually debate about whether we were going to have a first phase or a second phase or any of those things. I was saying, here's $2 million, go spend it. Thank you. Um, and I think it's unfortunate, and I recognize that there are concerns that, you know, 35, 40, I, there could be 100 businesses that are like, wait a minute, I didn't hear about that. Okay. Like, I don't think that that is on us. I think if there was an expectation of don't worry, there's a second phase coming, maybe that, maybe that shouldn't have been said, maybe that shouldn't have been done. But I don't think that if somebody has an expectation that there was other money coming, that wasn't, that's not on me, that's not on the council. And for me, I, I say get the money out there. Why are we going through another process that we already went through with a huge robust process? We talked with people on the committee that are like, oh man, not that they wouldn't, right? But if I was a committee member, I won't speak for any committee member, but if I was a committee member, I'd be like, seriously, you want me to do this again? When I already did all of this? And so I, I truly, truly feel good about the process. I feel good about the decisions that were made by the committee, and I want to spend the money. Okay. Get it out there. And I feel good about option C because I know that we have some of that nonprofit stuff. Again, I feel good about that decision. I feel good about that process that y'all went through. And at this point, get the money out there. That's what we were intending to do. Um, and, and I'm speaking to you, but mostly I'm speaking to the people <laughs> sitting right here. Right. No, it's actually we're nice to you. Right? You know, we're we're connecting. This group court does this all if, the time, too. They talk could, to each other through uh, the attorneys. But. We've got May Council Member Valdemoros and then Council Member Petro. Yeah, I feel strongly, I agree 100% with Councilmember Fowler because we've talked about this with other issues for years now. And that we need to get thing, things that are easier, like the, the low hanging fruits, we need to get going. Like this is not, and these are urgent ones where it's been a year that the money has been sitting in our bank account and people need it. Um, two, 
I am not sure where this phase two idea came up. Like, was it, did we in a discussion say we're going to have phase one and phase two or was it something that you made a decision and you told applicants, hey, don't worry, if you don't get it this time, you'll get it the second I think, time. I think that's a very fair question and a good question. I want to also respond to Council Member Fowler and mm -hmm. you as well, um, Council Member Valdemoros. As part of the process, uh, when we started this, we did a listening tour. Uh, we never want to pretend that we know everything because we don't. We want to learn and we want to grow. So our team actually went into the community, asked questions, and something that came out. So I want you to know that this was not designed to, to benefit us as public servants, but rather it was designed um, because we received really good feedback from the community, but also to benefit. And I, let me explain to you how it was decided. Um, we heard that often diverse communities, diverse businesses don't hear about this, which I think we, I, I thank you for the, the kind words that you gave us. Um, so, but a lot of times they do hear about it, but because they're working so hard, they're head down, try to make ends meet, they miss deadlines. And furthermore, a lot of times diverse communities, when they see a program by the government, because of their life experiences, often those communities you see refugees, immigrants, they don't believe that these programs are real. There's no such a thing in their minds of free money. So we created a phase two to basically meet the needs of those populations that we deeply care and we understand what they face. So the second phase, we actually, when we presented to the community phase one, we did express to them that there would be a phase two. Will you repeat that again? When we went out in the community, we did, and we presented, we did tell the community that there was going to be a phase two. We didn't commit the amount of money that was going to be on a phase two, but, but we have an ongoing basis told them that we're doing a phase two. But that, Go ahead. But we said we want to have two phases with $2 million. You, administration, go ahead, offer $2 million, but in two phases. Like is, your, council decided is your question that, as whether council decided that? Uh, the answer to that would be no. We created the program based on the feedback we received from the community, diverse communities, but you did not. Okay, I appreciate that, and I, Jorge, I love this project, like you. the process. I've seen staff go to businesses and drop off applications, business by business, like I've seen them. I've also seen groups that deal with refugees yes. have been very successful at the amount of applications that there are in this round. Yes. You have more than 10 out of refugee yeah. communities, so I don't feel like we, you know, we did, we're doing a disservice, like we didn't do enough for that, like applications, and I've seen them work as well, like what you said, where they don't have time to yes. do everything, but they did submit on time. So that's where, that's one point. Second point is, this, uh, this money is money that it's needed because a loss was suffered at some point. So if you as a business, are able to prove that you suffered because of COVID, then you're entitled to get some relief from the federal government. That's right. Correct. And so the $2 million need to get out. Like you don't, you don't, as a business, I feel it's so unfair. If I, as a business owner, I would feel so unfair that I showed you guys my taxes. I showed you my, my business. I show, I proved to you that I suffered a loss. I'm entitled to this, to this funding, to this relief, but because of a committee or because of maybe my, my writing was very good or I didn't explain myself very well, yes. now how to do a phase two. That's where I feel like, that's where I feel strongly that we go with option C and, and move on from this and get the money out. I have businesses texting me after last week, hey, what's happening with this money? We've been waiting. We're, on, we're closing our doors very soon if we don't get this. Please, please move this faster, and I, and I agree with them. 
So thank you. No, thank you. Councilmember Petro. I want to reiterate what's been said, and especially in my district, thank you to the people from your department who literally called me to make sure you were being as comprehensive as possible and reaching every business possible. Um, your outreach is quite exceptional, and it's an embarrassment of riches that we have this problem in front of us because it is your conscientiousness and the amazing way you look at economic development that's causing us to be in this situation. Um, I'm not going to contribute anything new to this exact, this specific situation that hasn't already been said. Um, and I'm hoping that in our lifetime we don't experience something where we're in this kind of disaster relief position again. However, with climate change, the likelihood that, I don't know, we could be conduits for FEMA funding feels more and more likely every day. Um, so I would like to revisit maybe citywide grant making processes, whereas certain grants, like our Arts Council grants, rightfully are competitive grants. Like Council Member Valdemoros was saying, these really should be qualification grants, where if you meet a threshold, you qualify for funding, and then whatever rating system we use should only be used to help us decide when we have more requests than funding available, how do we divvy up that pot in ways that are reflective. So I, I'm not going to add anything more to this specific situation, but going forward, this might be a good impetus for us to offer you all more clarity so you don't... So your good intentions and good work don't cause you to have to go 10 extra steps. Mr. Chair. Thank you so much. We're, we're happy to look at additional programs and how we can do it and better. it wouldn't just be for you. It would be for any of us who are <laughs> dealing with it. So. Mr. Chair. Okay. Council Member Pui. So I, um, I, I just wanted to, I think I feel like because I've been asking you questions about this, um, about when this phase two was announced and you know the outreach that the community was was done with the community about from day one mm -hmm. uh, that there is going to be a phase two and the amount the extensive many months of outreach to the community and I think the confusion I think that maybe the sticking point is this does this council decided that there was going to be a phase two or not to me. Well, it seems to be a, a, a you know a question that we're struggling with. This this city uh, that we are part of has said, regardless if we like it or not, to the to the small business community, there is going to be a second round, and now we have applicants there waiting. Um, so that to me is very important. Now, I don't think we, we are actually changing the rules by removing that as a city, not as a council, because I guess this, this council didn't decide that. But as a city, we are. Now, we also said in this meeting we respect the advisory board's decision, but then we are taking ignoring their decision. So, so how why? do we create if if i was some someone looking from the outside in why would i be part of any advisory board in this city um if I'm going to be just ignored every time I, I, you know, what will be the point? I think it is, uh, we definitely learned a lot of things about this, and I second uh, Victoria's point on, ab about this, looking forward in the future. But right now we are in a hot potato. I think that this is probably funds that we're never going to see again, uh, crossing my fingers, but most likely yeah. we're debating about something that is very unique. Uh, to to COVID and mm -hmm. never we never seen anything like this and the administration has never seen like this, but this decision uh, is already out there and we should stick with it. Um, it's fair, it's the equitable thing. My district has only a few businesses that applied. District one only has one business that applied in the phase one that we have is unequitable and I believe that keeping a second round is the equitable thing to do. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. I, I just wanted to add one thing, if I may. Um, I think for clarity purpose, when we develop programs, when we get feedback from the community, it would be wonderful to fully understand the separation of power, what's my administrative versus what is policy. And when we created the program, we 100% believe that this was an administrative decision. Therefore, we created a program with phase two. Um, we didn't do it in any way to be disrespectful or disregard council's opinion on this, but rather we thought we had the authority to proceed accordingly. So I just wanted to say that. And I think you had one more comment you wanted to? Yeah, I had a couple more comments just on the 
the equitable issue, and thank you, Lorena, for clarifying that. Um, we understood council's directive, besides give out this money now, was also by the ordinance language, make this process more equitable. So we heard that loud and clear. When we went out to the community partners and we asked what would make this more equitable, a phase two was strongly suggested because the community um, who's historically marginalized doesn't often take part in phase one of anything. Um, so PPP had multiple phases, um, which is the payroll protection program. Our previous iteration of grant funding, which is the uh, emergency loan program, had a second phase. So we've just listened to the community and, and took this to be an equitable measure, not as seizing authority in any way. Nope. Um, I would also say that our community partners, when we responded by creating the phase two, we reviewed, and this is a, was part of our slide presentation to them, had the reasons why we included a phase two and they responded very favorably to that because we listed that it was an equitable measure would allow people to get over the part of distrust in government, which as you know, during COVID was high. Yeah. Um, and the third thing I will say is that all of these applicants, regardless of how they scored or whether they showed that they had impact from COVID, which as you mentioned, Council Member Maldemoros was important. Important. The second thing that was important, though, um, was the eligible use of funding. And because that's of high importance to the federal government, not all of the applicants who scored lower had a good use of funding or, or an eligible use of funding. So we have to go back with finance once we know who the funding group is and review all of these budgets, not only because of the sliding scale and the unique um, situation that that created by adjusting budgets, but we also have to review for eligibility. And I would say that lower scoring applicants didn't necessarily score well because their eligible use of the money was not what was in ARPA guidelines. So we do have to review for that as well. So yes, they're allowed and eligible um, because they've proven a loss, but that doesn't mean that their plans for using the money will meet the bar. So I just wanted to make sure that that was understood, that we have that additional requirement that we have to meet. And so some of those lower scoring applicants may not meet that bar. Thanks. Rachel, did you have something? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Lorena, I think, covered this point. But um, very much appreciate the council's allocation of these funds. Um, as you know, we worked really hard in partnership, hopefully with you, to build a grant program that would be as equitable as possible to get money out into the community. Um, you didn't have to allocate the money in this way, but we're thankful that you did so that we could, we could get money to businesses and to nonprofits. Um, the staff, both from economic development and finance, has taken a ton of time, along with the, the board members who are adding a lot of time to their regular board duties to try to make really conscientious, equitable, fair decisions here. And this, all the feedback that you've provided through this process is incredibly insightful. I think we'll absolutely keep this in mind as we build new programs in the future. Um, we do squarely think that this is an administrative issue in terms of how the program is built. But um, as I said, the feedback has been insightful, and we hope to continue doing these sorts of, you know, uh, community engaged, focused programs in partnership with the council. So thank you very much for your consideration here, and we hope that we can just continue with this program as it was built, as it was intended, as we've held it out to the community, and go from there. Thanks. Okay, I have a quick comment, and then Councilmember Valdemoros. I, I appreciate this discussion. It's a really hard one. I think for me the biggest piece that has sort of been brought up but not is that we've asked a lot of these volunteers and I feel really bad that we are um, asking them to do more work um, and, and Phil, it's hard for me to slow things, processes down when I know all of you have so many things on your plate that it would be nice to just check this box and move on to the next important thing. But I, I do understand that we've made these expectations. I, I just want to point, I, and this is a one of the people that was on the committee 
but I spoke with the one person I know and they let me know that they, they did not want to do a second round. They thought it was so much work. So yes, equity, yes, robust processes, yes, do a lot of outreach, but when we're asking volunteers to volunteer their time on committees and boards and then to serve on in additional capacities in addition to those committees and boards, we need to really cherish that time and make sure that we're not asking them to do more than is necessary. Along with that, the council has in the past, we have allocated money for stipends for board members. I think we really need to look at whether or not that is a happening is it and is it enough to overcome that burden of especially like single mothers or people of color who are traditionally disenfranchised asking them to do additional volunteer work is really unconscionable so make sure that we have those that those stipend dollars are a adequate and b actually getting dispersed councilor valdemoros thank you um and, and i think i think we talked with lorena about um that some people that may have scored lower, it's because maybe the uses, so the, the things that they want to use with my, maybe wasn't clear or is not eligible. So then my question is like, if we know it's not, or we're uncertain if this is legible, or if we know that these are not legible, then why would we um, uh, would you consider them at all? Like, does that make sense? Like, hey, this is for relief, and the relief says for operating costs, meaning um, paychecks, rent, all of the things. But if it's outside of that, then it's not eligible. So we cannot really review you because we can give you that money regardless. So that, that's one point that I'm still confused about. But the second one that I just thought, if we went with option C, or if we went with even option D, if we stayed as original, then there's another process coming up, which is another process to go to use, I mean, to choose the nonprofit that will actually distribute the $500,000, and then another prof process for the nonprofit to distribute the $50,000 they get to help other businesses. I mean, this, is, this money is being delayed and delayed, and delayed is not getting out to the community fast enough. And that's also, I just realized that's a huge concern for me as well. Even, so maybe, if we did go with option C or option D, then those five nonprofits that may get this money, then maybe we use that for some of the folks that might be eligible already but are not in the first phase. Like some sort of deal that to get this money out faster than taking another year to get $500,000 out in the community. You want to answer to the issue of eligibility? Yeah, yeah so on the eligible uses, um, it, it wasn't as cut and dry as this doesn't meet the eligibility, so you're not eligible to apply. A business would have allocated all of the reasons and put in their budget what they would like to allocate. All of those applications were also reviewed by the Department of Finance, and between staffs of our department and finance, we reviewed all that the business provided, and there's probably four options that work and one that doesn't. So when we do a comprehensive review of their budget, which is required before they receive funding, um, we can work with the business and say that one thing isn't allowed, where would you like to allocate what you had indicated would fit in that box, but we can move that, let's say $10,000 somewhere else into one of the categories that is eligible. So it's nuanced, it's not exactly you don't qualify, you're just trying to spend the money in the wrong place. It's a little bit more nuanced. I, I just want to say that we've worked side by side with the Department of Finance and they've been an incredible partner because of the fact that if we, this money is not allocated appropriately, the money will need to go back to the federal government. And we don't want to find ourselves in that situation. So that's <laughs> yeah. why it's so, it's complex, but also we are, we are making sure that we're following the right guidelines as we work with the Department of Finance. Right. Thank you. And then the $500,000, it's another process to allocate to a nonprofit, and then there's another, profit, another process for the nonprofit to allocate the $500,000, so, right? I, I believe so, but at the same time, once they allocate, you know, we're not, I mean, we're going to be involved in that process because they need to report back, but we're not gonna be in the weeds of how how they do it. All the details. And if they do it yeah, fast we're enough relying. or who they choose. Yes. So we're losing a little bit of... So, and if I may, um, 
we have um, Jake Maxwell, who is the chair of the committee. And, um, and Jake, I don't know if you would like to have some comments. Maybe your, your board has expressed that they're exhausted and, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. If, if you'd like to make a comment and make it quick, I, okay. I, we're, sure. sorry. I think we're <laughs> ready for, I, I don't, I don't anticipate that we're all going to get to the same place at the end of this discussion. So I think make a quick comment and then I think it's time for a straw poll from someone. I, I don't have an understanding that the board is exhausted. I think that they're all very passionate about who stands to benefit above themselves. Um, but that's just my perspective of the board. Thanks. Council members, absent any new discussion, I think we should just straw poll this. Uh, to be honest, none of the options satisfy all of my concerns, so I, I'm, I'm not sure. I'd, I'd like to just make a straw poll that we uh, go with option D. Can you put that yeah. Up? yeah. And option D is uh, continue on with what we have here with uh, a second phase and no bonus points. The one, uh, okay, is there any discussion to the straw poll? I would like to say that that is the the option that the board, you know, is following the board's advice. So not ignoring the board's advice, uh, which I think is important, and also keeping the community uh, that told us to do a second round. Um, so that to me is important. So I have a question to staff: If it were, if we were making a motion, and someone wanted, it would, they would have to amend. Or propose a substitute motion. In this case, if a straw poll fails, does somebody else get to just propose a new straw poll? And we don't need to do any, or they have the option of making a friendly amendment to the straw poll. Okay, does everyone understand the straw poll at Councilmember Dugan? Is there any discussion to that straw poll? And or amendments? Okay, then show your feelings on Councilmember Dugan's straw poll. Before we have so we have two voting yes to the straw poll, council members Pui and Dugan, and the remaining five voting no. Do we have a separate straw poll? Mr. Chair, I, oh, go ahead. I was going to try A. Let's see if A sticks. <laughs> there seems to be a straw poll out there. Go ahead, council member yeah, Petro. Let's do A, which is the increase for 42 applicants, uh, and then bonus points in phase two. With the bonus points added? May I may uh, uh, friendly, friendly amendment to this? Okay. I am okay, uh, and I said it at the beginning. I'm okay harvesting the money and uh, supporting uh, those businesses that scored high. I think that makes a lot of sense. I also don't want to hurt the businesses that got, by the, the scoring. I think it is unfair. I would like to support this. If Can I just confirm real quick then? Those from round one who want to reapply in round two, it's an easy re reapplication. It's like a click of a button. No more manpower hours. We have for what you've asked of us. We that's what we okay. hope to do. Right. And if, that's, if that's there and there's no more manpower hours, I can forget that. Okay. So, Councilmember Pui's amendment is option A without the bonus points. Am I understanding that correctly? Yes. yes. Okay. Does everyone understand the straw poll? Straw poll. Is there any more discussion of the straw poll? Absent that, show your feelings. Okay, that looks like it's four to three with four yeses. Those being Councilmember Dugan, myself. Five yeses. Oh, five to two. Councilmember Dugan, myself. I wasn't counting myself correctly. <laughs> Councilmember <laughs> Petro, Councilmember Wharton, and Councilmember Pui with Council Members Fowler and Valdemaros voting no right. or polling no. All right. Thank you. Thank you for engaging us in this. Could I could I ask one thing? We raised the issue of rounding. Wanted to make sure oh, yeah. that the decision, what you decide on that issue, I don't want to walk away and then have to. Issue of what? Rounding, rounding up the numbers. Rounding. rounding. So meaning if somebody did, um, was, was granted 5,492, we're going to do 5,500. Round up to the nearest 100. The nearest 100. I'm, I'm okay with that, yeah. Yep. Okay. okay, so in on the issue of rounding, please round up to the nearest hundred. That's seven to zero. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. We'll talk about rounding the rest time, the next time. Okay. So thank only, you. Yes, thank you. Okay, so we are at three twenty-five. Yes. Uh, just a, a logistics note: 
the option the council selected is different than the funding log included in packets. So economic development staff will provide an updated funding log. We'll send that out to you and add it to the packet. I'm also going to update the motion sheet since some council members have asked to be recused. Uh, please let me know if you would like to be recused from an applicant and I missed it so we can get it ready for the vote tonight. Thanks, Ben. All right, so that takes us to item number five. Item number five is an ordinance for Glendale, Glendale Regional Park plan. Our break is not scheduled for another hour. How are council members doing? Doing all right? Okay, so let's go to item number five. We have at the table, um, Allison Rowland, council policy analyst, also Cat Moss, public lands planner, and available in the audience for questions is director of our public lands department, Kristen Riker. Allison, do you have a quick introduction? Thank you, Mr. Chair. You. It's not as quick as usual. Okay, I apologize, a long but introduction. I just want to be sure to mention a couple budget things that I think you'll be interested in. Um, so this is the full draft of the Glendale Regional Park Plan from the Department of Public Lands. And the idea here is to repurpose the 17-acre Glendale Water Park site. Uh, this briefing today was originally scheduled for February 21st, uh, but Public Lands wasn't able to do it on that day, so that's why we're doing it today, March 7th, which is the same day as the public hearing. So you'll have a public hearing tonight on this topic, and then potential action will be on March 21st, which is the next formal meeting. The plan's goals, which I'm sure Kat will mention in more detail, are to provide a, the guiding vision and design for the future park and establish a framework for development and programming at the park. It's also to create a park that serves the neighborhood and also has amenities that create a regional attraction. Like most plans, the Glendale Regional Park Plan sets out aspirations for full park build-out, but the funds for many of the features and activities have not yet been identified. This means that full implementation of the plan will be contingent on funding availability year to year, typically. Dep the department received council approval to begin work on phase one implementation last summer, which was before this draft plan was completed and adopted because a portion of the park must be open by April 2024. This is a requirement of the Federal Land and Water Conservation Fund, which originally funded the city's purchase of the site. The Land and Water Conservation Fund requires that active recreation be publicly accessible on site within three years of beginning to remove, sorry, of beginning to remove existing amenities. This is a complex site. I'll leave it to Kat to uh, discuss that aspect in more detail, but just to briefly hit on the funding, the budget estimate for full build-out of Glendale Regional Park is currently 30 to 50 million. That's a big range, um, but as the construction drawings get underway, uh, the, the department plan, well, it will have to have more precise estimates as it goes along, so, so those will narrow. Um, the council has already approved roughly $8.5 million for site preparation, planning, um, a CIP application, and, and a few other things. And then, as you know, the GO bond that voters approved last November will provide $27 million for capital improvements for the park. Full management and maintenance costs are not provided in the plan, and this, this is not unusual. Um, but as a reminder, last year, Parks Maintenance became eligible for a share of the annual Funding Our Future sales tax revenue, which last year was funded at a two, with a $2 million allocation. And um, we'll, we'll, have more, we'll have additional uh, information on that, I'm sure, when we start the fiscal year 24 budget. The plan, this plan also proposes a unique level of ongoing programming and activation. The annual costs estimated in the plan are at least $613,000 per year. Um, and the reason is this kind of programming and activation that really other parks in, in Salt Lake City do not see. It also proposes additional full-time employees one new full-time on-site programming manager, and two part-time seasonal park attendants. 
Um, there are several other positions mentioned in the plan, and they might be shared across several sites, depending on, on how things work out. The department also says it will continue to explore relevant grant, donation, and partnership opportunities. The previous steps in the planning process include site analysis, conceptual planning, public engagement, reviews of previous drafts by the council on May 3rd and October 4th last year. So if, these, if uh, this seems familiar, there's a reason for it. Uh, both the Parks, Natural Lands, Urban Forestry and Trails Advisory Board, or PNET, and the Transportation Advisory Board, TAB, reviewed the plan and provided letters of support. The Community Advisory Committee, which formed specifically to guide the development of the plan, also reviewed the full draft and supports it, as does the Glendale Neighborhood Council. The plan was also unanimously recommended for approval by the Planning Commission with, and I'll quote here, the proviso that the City Council pay special attention to operations, maintenance, security, and staffing for the park as it goes into use. There are some policy questions scattered throughout the report. and several others grouped at the end, but I will turn it over to Kat. Hi, Kat. Hey. <laughs> um, awesome. Thank you so much, Allison, and thank you um, for having me again to talk about the Glendale Regional Park Plan, and um, secondary thanks for moving this on your agenda from the last meeting to this one. Um, I'm really, really excited to be here in front of you today um, as we kind of near the finish line for this park's vision for the future. Um, it's a vision supported by robust community and public engagement, and as Allison mentioned, multiple city advisory boards. Um, and I've been here um, before you a couple of times to discuss the planning process and the materials contained within the plan. So I'll kind of focus on some new information that hasn't been shared prior um, with a focus on planning commission's recommendations as well. Um, next slide, please. So I'll just do a really quick overview to reorient you to the project. Um, the plan is for the new 17-acre park um, park site that will guide future improvements and development of Glendale Regional Park. And the plan incorporates programming, operations, and maintenance needs, outlines physical improvements for the site, and makes recommendation for additional exploration in the future. Um, it also reflects first and foremost the desires of the Glendale neighborhood while also making this a place that everyone in our city can enjoy um, by incorporating regional amenities that will draw people to the city's west side. Um, and as we move through the adoption process with this plan, um, the project team is working on detailed design and implementation of phase one with construction beginning this summer um, and will be completed by April 2024. Um, site demo is complete and we're now looking forward towards the development development of the site. Um, next slide, please. So just a quick review of the goals and mission statement um, shared with you previously. These were confirmed with our community advisory committee for the project and the general public through our engagement processes. Um, many of these goals will already be addressed and completed if this plan is adopted and others will guide the implementation of the plan itself. Um, ultimately, we want this park to be a vision led by the community and for it to reflect the neighborhood's culture, diversity, and needs. It needs to be a park that increases equitable access to nature and recreation and to provide programming and entertainment at low or no cost. Um, we also heard that one of the top priorities of this community and the city is for the creation of a safe space with high levels of programming to make it just really welcoming. Um, and while this vision is driven by the Glendale community, we know it needs to be a regional destination with the amount of funding this is receiving, um, connecting a number of open spaces along the Jordan River. And then finally, we heard a resounding need from both the youth we engaged with and the broader community um, that environmental quality and access to nature are really critical in enhancing this community's quality of life and then addressing some of the current environmental injustices. Next slide, please. So here is a really exciting, fun plan. Um, all of this planning work has had a direct influence on the final plan for the site to fulfill the goals that we set out to achieve. Um, based on all of the investigation and engagement, this space showcases gathering and event spaces with the inclusion of a community plaza, a flex stage and event space, and includes both passive and active recreation spaces with picnic lawns, full court basketball, and pickleball. And I just want to 
quick side note here in terms of the pickleball, just for additional clarification. The plan does include six brand new pickleball courts. Um, they're just not included in the graphic above because they're outside the 17 acres. They will be adjacent to the current tennis courts just to the west at the Glendale Neighborhood Park. Um, and they're anticipated for phase two of improvements. Um, full court basketball was ranked higher throughout our public engagement processes, so that's incorporated in our first phase. Um, and while we wait for these new six pickleball ball courts to be constructed, um, we're using blended lines on four of the current tennis courts. Um, we are also really sensitive to the fact that these tennis courts are very utilized currently, and the one Glendale plan completed in 2021 specifically notes need for new amenities and not replacement of currently used facilities. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that while you don't see that on this graphic, there is a proposal for six new pickleball courts in this project as well. And then in addition to these physical elements, the plan builds strong connections to other open spaces on the Jordan River Parkway Trail with development of features along the river there. Um, and finally includes the community's number one priority, which was an outdoor pool. Um, and this kind of shows the city's intent to strive to implement the community's vision and needs. And as we met with multiple advisory groups and the planning commission, it was clear that programming would be super essential to the site to keep it safe and usable and engaging um, as it comes online. So the plan also explores programming opportunities and plans as we move through construction. So next slide, please. Um, and as I've kind of mentioned in previous uh, presentations, public lands does not currently have a robust programming arm or the capacity to program a site of this scale. So as part of our planning process, we engaged a subconsultant, Agora Partners, to identify and further investigate potential programming opportunities and interests in the park. Um, they also explored potential immediate uh, potential programming immediately to phase one as it comes online, which is shown here on the screen. Um, they assessed the various amenities that will be added, brainstormed ideas for programming, and then actually began facilitating conversations and building relationships with stakeholders and external organizations that may be interested in programming the site. Um, and phase one is primarily consisting of a playground. Um, much of the programming potential is kind of geared around youth. However, access to the Jordan River will remain open and will allow for programming opportunities along the river as well. Um, and then with the, fa the passive lawn, um, there are also opportunities for outdoor experiential programming, arts, culture, and sports. And then next slide, please. We'll dive into programming for the full vision. Um, as we start bringing other phases online, there'll be opportunities for aquatic programming, performance and events, and potential within the skate and dog parks as well. Um, programming on the site will be really key in just creating that safe anchor space for the community and will provide a lot of opportunities for folks to enjoy and experience the whole park in different ways. Um, and there's a lot of in-depth information and programming recommendations within the plan itself. Um, next slide, please. So our, we had our consultant explore external opportunities for programming, um, but we also had them propose internal mechanisms to facilitate programming on site. Um, so shown on this screen here in this table and also within the plan, um, this is that 600 plus thousand that Allison mentioned. Um, these are recommendations that the consultant made um, for internal costs that may be associated with programming the site. Um, these recommendations are based on the site's full build out and in addition to our current public lands operations. Um, the plan looked at site visitation and operations, maintenance and programming associated with the anticipated uses. And the project team worked to determine future needs of the park, including maintenance and staffing based on the types of amenities and programmings, programming that we'll want to see on site. Um, they assessed the market potential of the park, who is likely to visit the park, when they're likely to visit the park from daily use to weekday and yearly distribution of that use, and then made recommendations as to how we can plan for that. Next slide, please. <clears throat> One other thing as that pulls up that I wanted to touch on that will have an impact on our operations, maintenance and programming is um, the site's certification. And this is different than any other projects or parks that we have in the city. Um, sites is a rating system based on the idea that a project has the ability to not only protect but improve and regenerate healthy ecosystems. 
um, in spaces by reducing water, filtering stormwater runoff, providing habitat, and improving air quality and human health. Um, the certification is managed by the United States Green Building Council, which is the same that manages the LEED rating system. Um, so SITES is kind of the equivalent rating system used for parks and landscapes that LEED is for buildings. Um, there's only one other certified landscape in the state of Utah, and Glendale would potentially be the first of its kind, the only public park certified in Utah. Um, and throughout the public engagement, it was really clear that access to nature, environmental quality, and environmental justice were all really high priorities. Um, so this certification process is kind of one of the ways we can fulfill these goals. Um, the certification process begins with the planning of the site and continues long beyond development with sustainable operations and management strategies implemented over the long term. And so because of this, the planning of the site has involved a really multi-dimensional integrated team with a lot of different players that include, have included our operations and maintenance staff from the beginning. Um, and this will just set Glendale apart, making it kind of an ecological example of what our park spaces can be and aid in the seamless transition from the planning of a project to implementation and management. Um, and then next slide, I'll just touch on phase one briefly. Um, so this site, as Allison mentioned, received funding from the Land and Water Conservation Fund. Um, a condition of that is that the site may only be inaccessible to the public for recreation for a maximum of three years, which will conclude for us April 2024. So to meet that deadline, design for phase one is significantly underway. Um, we're also splitting phase one into two kind of parts, phase 1A and phase 1B, so that we can deliver this recreational <laughs> component by that time. Um, phase 1A includes an all-ages playground with accessible design and assistive technologies, and phase 1B will come immediately after, including um, a community gathering space and plaza, um, parking, and plantings, native plantings in the site. And then um, this was selected to build upon the current Glendale Park site just to the west to kind of make an impact with our um, first round of development that will be open. Um, and we're really, really excited to see this start coming online in April of next year. Um, so next slide, I think that's it. Um, thank you so much for your time today. Happy to answer any questions on the broader plan or some of the things we touched on today. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Pat. <clears throat> Council members. Awesome. Council yeah. member Dugan. <laughs> Thank you, Kat. Appreciate that. And appreciate the effort on across the board on this park. This is this is pretty exciting stuff. Uh, for a long time, I'm always concerned about the access across 1700 South and from 1700 South, and uh, the cost of improving that street calming and the access across that road, and making sure that it is a safe road so people can go walk back and forth across that is. 30 to 50 million dollars is a big spread so is the is that street calming and the access across from 1700 part of the earlier parts of the phases i know not phase one but early part of the phases and do we have the funding have we looked at wfrc and the state on helping us fund that side of it yes thank you so much for that question um and just to iterate, that was one of the number one concerns that the community had as well was that access there. Um, and we have been working really closely with the transportation division on how to improve that access. Um, while it's not specifically called out within the Glendale uh, Regional Park funding, the transportation division does have immediate funding to work on improvements across 1700 South right now. Sorry. <laughs> um, and then are pursuing additional funding in the future for more major renovations. Um, but we're working in very close collaboration with them to improve that. Um, and then TAB and our peanut board um, recommendation letters also are kind of we added a recommendation within our master plan, there this, this plan to address um, public transportation in that area to make that a little bit better and specifically address safe crossings on 1700 South. Thank you, a couple more questions. Go ahead, Mr. Chair. On the uh, O&M costs, you mentioned $613,000 a year and the security side of the house and, uh, and those wrap ups, how does that compare to say the costs that we budget for Liberty or Pioneer Park, uh, and are they compatible, uh, comparable? I guess on the on the costs compared to Liberty, and the social, and then also 
same thing on Liberty, and you have the visitations of year, of, you know, 350 to 450, depending on day or night. Uh, How does that compare to Liberty and Pioneer Park as far as visitations? Yeah, I can touch on a little bit of that, but I, I, I'm not sure in full comparison to those two. But um, our consultants looked at parks of this size in communities of this size to make those recommendations, and they were reviewed by our internal um, finance staff to kind of confirm that um, in comparison to Liberty and Pioneer. I might defer to Kristen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I'm going to be able to give you a better answer. Um, Liberty Park is 100 acres um, and this facility is 17. They both have swimming pools, although the county pays for the operations of the swimming pool at Liberty Park. Um, we don't pay for that. And then um, the aviary, which I'm not sure how many acres that is, but um, they are self-sustaining. Five acres. Eight eight acres. Um, so they're self-sustaining, so pull those out. Um, also, um, at Liberty Park, we use secondary water, and so um, we don't pay for water. So it's, they're, it's really, they're not apples to apples. It's really going to be difficult to estimate, and depending on the size of the pool that we um, put in and the amenities that are built Did out. you say the full build-out of Glendale is 17 acres? Yeah, the, um, the, the new piece is 17 acres. And the how existing is the, eight, uh, right? So the whole area together, which, I mean, in, in the end will function as kind of one big regional park, right? How big is that? 25-ish uh, with the current Glendale Neighborhood Park. If you count all of the contiguous spaces from the golf course down Jordan River, it's about 150 acres. Mm, okay. <laughs> Mr. Chair? Yep, Councilman Puy. Um, when I was um, looking at your document, um, there was a cl climate considerations page that said 29% of the year, Salt Lake City is comfortable only on 29% of the year, 7% of the year is too hot, and 64% of the year is too cold, which kind of shocking to me, but I guess we might have different definitions. Um, I think it's more than 29% of the year, but... That bears uh, the question not related to the pool. So if the community, I don't know, you know, how this data, I mean, this is based on data, I guess, uh, but like what is comfortable, defined comfortable, right? But does it mean that 64% of the year the pool will be closed or not, like, what, you know, and then what, I'm going to have this gigantic, you know, empty concrete thing uh, not used because most people think it's too cold for it. So. Um, have we thought through that, and what are we going to do about that, since the community is also asking for a water amenity? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'll touch on a couple elements. Um, so the pool is also, um, as Kristen mentioned, the county operates almost all of our pools currently, and an outdoor water feature specifically is listed in the county's 2015 Parks and Recreation Master Plan for this exact site. Um, so that's specified as outdoor. And then the community also specified an outdoor swimming pool because of the proximity to the indoor um, Sorensen Multi Multicultural Center, Signer West is an indoor amenity. Um, so it was requested specifically by the community and the county to explore an outdoor amenity. Um, you're absolutely right. I think we deal with this, I think, at Liberty Park as well. Um, there is a good portion of the year where that space isn't utilized and I think that would be something that we would have to deal with here as well. 64% um, of the year seems like a, a lot of unused time. I wouldn't anticipate it maybe being there but um, yeah it's a really great point and something that we definitely will have to deal with as this moves forward. The county's pools are open Memorial Day through Labor Day and um, all of them, except for Steiner East. That one has a little bit of an extension and they, they stay longer because they have so much, so much use there and it's a large lap swimming pool. Um, but all the others close. We had conversations with the county, we have had, and we will continue to have conversations with the county. We would love for them to continue to take on this as well because we don't operate any pools. The county operates all of our pools. Uh, and so we would love for them to take this on their master plan says that they'll have an outdoor water amenity, but they're not, um, it did not specify an outdoor pool. They were thinking more of a, a splash pad. Um, <clears throat> and when that was brought to the community, as Kat said, that wasn't what the community wanted. They would love to see another indoor pool because there is a lot of um, lap swimmers and swim teams that are looking for space always in areas like that. 
we're trying really hard to represent the community request and needs and we strongly heard that they want an outdoor pool in this location because that's what was there and so this is the replacement for that. So we're hoping that the county will partner with us on that. Uh, they didn't say no. I can't say they were um, overly enthusiastic either. They've had a really rough year with finding lifeguards and staff for outdoors and summertime swimming pools. So. Just one more thing on the pool. Um, this is one element within the master plan that we know we want to include but will require a lot of additional engagement to kind of determine what the community does want to see there. Um, so that will be coming as that amenity comes online. <clears throat> Um, council members, other questions on this? I had a quick question on the, um, it kind of relates to what you were just talking about, about, the programming of our parks, understanding that we do not have a robust system for programming our parks as a city. Um, but what are some of, are, can you maybe get a little more granular about what some of the partnership potential might be with Glendale Park, but also other parks throughout the city in order to increase program? I, I think of Tracy Aviary or things like that as actually really excellent um, sort of partnerships that we have. Also, I see Dustin in the back with the rides at Liberty Park. I, I think those sort of um, programming partnerships that we have are really a great way for us to activate the parks um, and not necessarily at our own dollar or our own staff member time, but allowing businesses or nonprofits to function within our public lands as long as they're like com compatible things. What are, what are some, are, are there any specific ideas about Glendale Park and or how might that, those ideas translate to other parks? Yeah, I can touch on Glendale. Um, so Agora Partners was our sub consultant that was specifically dedicated to programming and they um, kind of came up with a, a document to, enhance the Glendale Regional Park vision plan um, that was basically all their background investigation on the partnerships they've been investigating throughout the development of this plan. Um, and we've also brought them on board throughout the phase one development to determine um, which specific relationships we should be building for phase one and how to kind of incorporate that programming in immediately once those amenities come online. So we're working with them to kind of finalize that document. Um, of, it's basically a list of organ, uh, folks within organizations that are interested in short and long-term programming opportunities um, at this site specifically. Um, and I, a huge shout out to our community advisory committee as well for providing a lot of those um, recommendations for organizations and programming. Um, so we're hoping to have that document kind of finalized and ready to go um, that we can utilize for phase one. Um, in terms of the rest of the city. And I'll just add that um, creating infrastructure for events like that is really important and um, that was thought about with this in particular with you know the Great Lawn and the passive space that we have available. Um, considering 5K runs, uh, there's a lot of requests for 5K runs. Um, music opportunities um, to have music and festivals that was considered in in this design and so those are the things that currently at at Liberty Park we're maxed out on right and so we are hoping to have um, shift some of that those requests over to another location and this would make a really great location for some of those those uh, activities as well you mean Liberty Park cannot handle more handle the requests that are coming in? Excuse me? When, the, when you say Liberty Park's maxed out, what does that mean? Oh, every weekend is booked at Liberty Park. Yes, oh, there's, okay. For, with activities. So um, I think that, I appreciate that. That's something that's a, a goal for me. And so if we can figure out a way, like maybe even just, I don't know, if some organization has an idea, who do they contact? Is there a form on the website where they can figure out how to, partner with the city in order to bring activation into our parks. I think just building out that partnership is, is really important. So thank you for including it in this and look forward to future discussions about increasing that. Definitely. Council Member Dugan, and then I think we'll move on to the yeah, next I just, item. Uh, yeah, in our staff report, there's uh, five policy questions from one of them being the, uh, the budgeting uh, side. You know, we have some 
items that aren't uh, impact fee eligible or geo bond eligible. So what's our what's our plan or strategies to uh, address those to the park rangers? Uh, how do we incorporate this in, in the park ranger program? Or uh, when do we uh, bring those park rangers and how they are the attendance just for Liberty Park or they or I mean Glendale Park or they with the park rangers? So there's five policy questions that I'd like to be addressed at a future time. The, on the back of the page. Okay. You don't have to address them now, but unless you want to. In, yeah, we can definitely respond to those. Maybe okay. should we request a written response, and then if yeah. you feel like it's necessary for, if yeah. anyone feels like it's necessary for another discussion, we can discuss, we can decide whether or not that we have time for that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you so much for this. We're, I think we're all really excited about this new amenity on the west side. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Are we good to keep going, or should we take a break now? I, I was, let's take a five minute break. Well, let's do 10 minutes and then we'll go into budget amendment number six. So 10 minute break means we come back at 4.05. All right, we're on item number six. Item number six is an ordinance about budget am amendment number five for fiscal year 2022 through 2023. Ben Ludke, I believe, is our staff member on this, and we have Mary Beth Thompson and John Vike here in the, uh, at the table. Ben, do you want to give us an introduction? Uh, yes, I've got an introduction, and then we can run through the individual items. This is the first briefing for Budget Amendment Number 5. The public hearing is scheduled for tonight. There are 24 proposed amendments totaling over $33 million of expenditures. Of that, 6.2 million is proposed to come from general fund balance. If approved, fund balance would be at 22.9%. That translates to $40.5 million above the 13% minimum target. There are three items that are urgent with straw polls being requested. I'll point those out as we get to them. And Scott, can you put page two of the staff report up? That's the one. This is a follow-up from previous council discussions. Uh, staff heard the council wanted to track items approved mid-year in budget amendments to understand the potential new ongoing cost that would need to be included in the next general fund annual budget. So in the chart, we have the budget amendments listed in the first column, then the items, the estimated cost for the next annual budget, whether any new FTEs, full-time employees were approved, and then notes and context. In the bottom row, we have totals. So out of these items, it's a little over $3.2 million that might be needed in the next annual budget for the general fund. And this covers 18 FTEs. And some important points, out of those 18 FTEs, by far the biggest chunk is the very first item, the Homeless Shelter Cities Mitigation Grant. That is 13 FTEs, $2.2 million. The city expects to apply for that funding annually. Assuming the funding is provided, it would cover those costs. But if the city is awarded less than it needed, then the general fund would pick up the difference. There's also three FTEs for the GEO Parks Bond, and the general fund fronted the cost to pay for those employees this fiscal year. The council has the option for the bond to pay for those three employees going forward, but that's a future decision. So we welcome any feedback if this is meeting the council's intent and we'll update it as we proceed through budget amendments in the year. I 
Scott, can you go to the next page? These are the revised revenue updates. Most of the uh, favorable uh, revenue line items are being driven by sales tax and interest income. We're currently 8.4 million uh, above the amended budget. And I believe uh, Mary Beth is working on a sales tax update to come to the council with the next budget amendment. If there's not any questions, I'll jump into the individual items. Thank you, Scott. Item A1, this is a request for $25,000 from general fund balance for a rapid intervention team second trailer. It's a one-time purchase to enable the team to spend less time waiting in line at the landfill. Having a second trailer would allow the team to take their fully loaded trailers to the landfill in the morning when the lines are much shorter so they can spend more time out in the community working. A2 is a request for $2.65 million from general fund balance for city hall earthquake repairs. Council members may remember seeing similar items in previous budget amendments. This is in addition to the 9.2 million that was previously approved. With the additional funding, repairs to City Hall are expected to be fully funded and all the expenses are expected to be reimbursed by insurance. It's a mixture of the city fronting some of the money for later reimbursement and some of the payout from the insurance on the front end. This does include secondary costs like protection of artwork, <coughs> temporary office moves, and consultants. The repairs could take one to two years depending on when a contractor bid is selected and work uh, as it proceeds. There could be surprises as they look into the walls, but one to two years is the estimate. And note that the cost of inflation experienced since the earthquake in March 2020 will be covered by insurance. This is the first item that has a straw poll requested, so the request for proposals can go out. Mr. Chair. Yep, go ahead, Councilmember Dugan. Just a like a propose a straw poll for uh, uh, approving item 2A2, earthquake, city hall earthquake repairs. Okay, does everyone understand the straw poll? This is for the 2.65 and it should be recouped from insurance in the future dates. So we'll be seeing this back. All right, show your feelings. That is six voting yes, zero voting no. Councilmember Fadler is not here. D D Mr. Chair, yep. does the... Um does the administration prefer that we do that on the items? Do we, do we need to start doing that with most of the items or just three of them? Okay. There are three Thanks. that are urgent, right? Mary Beth, Correct. what are the other two? I know the other two are for IMS. A3 yep. and A5. Correct. Okay. Do we have a straw poll on those two or did we not go through those yet? Go ahead, Ben. I can go over them right now, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. A3 is a request for fiber conduit to improve connections between city facilities as part of the 200 South reconstruction project. It's $242,000 from the IMS fund. So this would include several of the city facilities downtown and on the west side, including the airport, Pioneer Park, and multiple offices. It also has the benefit of increasing capacity as the city's needs grow. Including this in the reconstruction project will mean some cost savings. You don't have to tear up the street twice and less disruption to the neighborhood. Mr. Chair, I'd uh, propose a straw poll for A3 to approve the fiber conduit to improve the connections between the city's facilities and the part of the 200 South of $242,000. Is 
in t- two thousand two hundred forty two thousand dollars two hundred eighty five. Thanks, Council Member Dugan. Does everyone understand the straw poll? Any discussion? If not, go ahead and indicate your feelings. That is again six to zero in support of the straw poll. If Councilmember Fowler not here. And then the other item that has a straw poll request is A5. $2.4 million from the IMS fund for public safety radio replacement cost increases. You may remember this from CIP last year. The council approved $3.7 million for the same purpose. So the total funding, if you approve this item, would be 6.1 million for public safety, handheld and mobile radios, as well as fixed control stations. And then of course, removal of the old and installation of the new equipment. This is separate from the seven and a half million dollars from the sales tax bond last year. Those bond funds are going to the radio towers and the related infrastructure that creates the network serving these radios that are used by many city employees. Enterprise funds, including the airport and public utilities, they're budgeting to cover radio equipment replacements within their future budgets. IMS does expect another two million will be needed for non-public safety radios, but that'll be in future fiscal years. I have a question. Councilmember, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, this is a lot of money, uh, but it seems to be a very needed, uh, you know, item. Uh, what is the life expectancy, if we can guess, of something this major? I think radio ex- life expectancy is at least 20 years. Okay. Um, the reason we're, we're requesting the straw poll is because um, the expense for the radios continues to go up and up. And um, it would be about another 8% increase if we don't get the straw poll and under contract. So getting that through, hopefully, in 20, we, can, we will not necessarily talk too much about this, except for that extra $2 million that was we might be needed uh, for another 20 years, hopefully. Yeah, these radios are for public safety. That's where we're starting with. And then we would um, branch out to the other departments in another budget, uh, budget proposal. Thank you. To the point that this is a, a large amount of money at one time, IMS shared that they're looking at creating a ongoing radio replacement program. So instead of waiting to replace them all at one time with a larger expense, it would be replaced in smaller batches ongoing, similar to what is done with computers. So Mr. Chair, go ahead. I'd like to make a straw poll for the approval of a, item A5, public safety radio replacement cost of $2.4 million. Any discussion to this? Go ahead. It looks like that's again six to zero with Council Member Fowler absent, six being in the affirmative. That takes us to A6, a request for a quarter million dollars from the IMS fund for consulting to replace the public utilities billing system, or PUBS. It was developed and expanded by IMS over the past two decades. Some general fund departments use the system too, like sustainability and community and neighborhoods. The funding would be used to hire a consultant to evaluate the city's needs and then recommend options for a new billing system. There is a little urgency to this because Microsoft is going to end support for the current system as soon as July of next year. That's why it's coming to you in a budget amendment and not in the annual budget. The next item is A7. This is a request to rescope existing funding for the Lindsay Gardens It was a CIP project in fiscal year 20 CIP. The rescope will take the remaining funds, $459,000, and authorize them for the reduced scope. The primary change is renovating a concession stand instead of a full rebuild 
at a new location with new utility lines, which is much more expensive. The Avenues Baseball League previously donated $10,000 toward the project. The funding level is probably not enough for even the reduced scope. The Public Lands Department would start with the concession stand renovation and then work down the list as far as the funding will go. The current league president uh, was made aware of the challenges with inflation and provided a note in support of this scope change. That's in the staff report if you want to take a look at it. That takes us to A8, a $1 million anonymous donation for the Avenues City Cemetery. This would be to recognize the revenue and the expenditure of the donation for maintenance and improvements at the cemetery. Uh, may I, uh, I have, may, Mr. Chair. Yes, go ahead, Councilman. So uh, can I uh, understand this a little more? Is there, um, so the, the money is coming we can I get a little more background on this one? It's Sorry. anonymous, apparently. So it's an anonymous donation. Um, we did a donation agreement with the, individu with the individuals that um, gave the donation, and it's specifically for the cemetery. Okay, thank you. Well, I'll just say thank you to whoever. That is very much appreciated. Cemetery angel. Cemetery needs as much love as we can give it. <laughs> yes, go ahead, Councilmember Petro. Um, does acceptance of this donation bind us to raise revenue? Can we have it and make whatever improvements it affords us without completing all of the Im improvements that need to be made? So this donation in the donation agreement, it specifies, but we don't need to, we need to use it for the specific use of the donation agreement but it doesn't tie our hands with any other revenues or expenditures. Thank you. Not like a match required. Correct. Very generous. Thank you. The next item, A9, is a request for one-time retention bonuses and ongoing hiring bonuses for police officers. We heard earlier today that the administration is working on a revised proposal it's expected to be available for a council briefing uh, as soon as next week. So I'll skip to the next item since the information in the staff report is not the latest. A10 is a request for $825,000 from general fund balance to facilitate acquisition of real property. Per state law, this is eligible to be discussed in a closed session. A11 is a request for $100,000 in additional funding to study the creation of a downtown Main Street pedestrian mall. This $100,000 is in addition to the $150,000 that was approved in the last annual budget. That 150,000 was from the RDA's central business district project area. The focus of the study is Main Street from South Temple to 400 South. And the study is separate from the actual implementation of the open streets concept. The options to close the street coming out of the study could be permanent or partial, and they could be based on different seasons, days of the week, and even times of the day. The scope of work includes examining the current street conditions, creating the planning and the design recommendations for the different scenarios, as well as visualizing what those concepts could look like as well as public outreach and cost estimates for each of the scenarios. There are two policy questions. The council may wish to discuss if the scope of work meets the council's goals for the study. The other question is about 
activating Main Street downtown this summer. The last few years, the council provided funding to partially close Main Street from South Temple to 400 South on weekends, from Memorial Day to Labor Day. There's currently no funding available to continue the program this summer. The council may wish to discuss with the administration what would be needed to continue the program. Of note, pandemic changes to state and city regulations are no longer in effect, and those previously helped facilitate the program. We do have a council added placeholder item I-1 in case this is something the council wanted to fund in this amendment. Council members, I know this is an item of much interest. Yes. Do you have a comment, Council Member Diggin, question? Uh, I, th I think this is a wonderful project and a wonderful program. I think closing Main Street down during the summertime or weekends or other time is, is an awesome uh, idea, and I want to continue to study it and, and implement it in some, in some uh, fashion. And, uh, and I really want to uh, push forward on activating for, for this summer also. So, uh, so those are two separate questions, right? A11 is the study for the permanent thing, and then I1 is um, street activation for this year. Is that correct, Ben? Well um, stated. Okay. And it's, I think it's just the placeholder number okay. because we That's don't really know how much it okay. is going to cost. Um, I, I don't know if this is the right place, but I am interested in what the, a little more detail about what those ordinance changes are that are making it more difficult this year than it was last year i assume it has something to do with private use of public real estate is it is there some, can some I, am i opening a can of worms that's going to take way 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 too long to discuss or could we get some quick information about that thanks peter murkowski from economic development can you hear me am i good all right there we go now we can yeah, so uh, some of the restrictions that we were, well, um, I guess more allowances that we were operating under during COVID and the pandemic uh, during uh, when the emergency proclamations were in place allowed us to do a lot more things with the street and allowing for the open streets event to happen in place with a lot less barriers. Uh, once those emergency proclamations dropped off, um, that we were kind of back to business as usual. And yes, we had some limitations in terms of using public space. Okay, so the pandemic ordinances basically said, go ahead and use whatever to keep your business afloat, and that's no longer the case. So I, I assume, I'm hoping there's still a path for us to do a similar thing. I may take another ordinance or something, but what you're saying is that right now, the ordinances don't allow that by right or at all? It allows for it. It has added additional cost to the event uh, that okay. made it a little bit more difficult to host. A cost, okay. sorry, Mr. J, a cost Brothers. from who? From the city? Like a real estate group will charge from now on or what cost? So we, yes, we did have to lease uh, public space on the sidewalk, which we didn't, uh, which we had temporary permits for uh, under uh, the previous, under those emergency proclamations. So there's some additional costs there. Uh, also additional costs uh, with closing the intersections and requirements for fire safety were also uh, a significant cost to the project as well. So those intersection costs would have been would have been costs in the previous years as well, right? Uh, Those have been costs. They have been costs, okay, yes. But new costs have to do with the permitting for the closure? Yes, and, uh, and while those aren't as significant uh, and can be overcome, uh, I think that the, the street closures and the requirements for street closure were the biggest uh, ticket item on that budget and what was kind of restricting us the most in hosting the event. When you say street, that's like the actual th things that close the street. The barriers. The barriers. Uh, yeah. not, not even just the barriers, but it was mostly the security that we had oh. to monitor, okay. monitoring those intersections, making sure that we were um, adhering to fire and safety's requirements. Mr. For the Chair. Thanks, Peter. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Councilman Pui. So I've been digging into this. Um, but look, Ben uh, Lutke here has been helping me try to find the numbers. Uh, and the spreadsheet that we've gotten uh, talks about security 
uh, it ranges of, you know, if we're going to do it only the weekends, if we're going to do it the whole week, right? like all these costs, except for the rental, right? It, it's somewhat fixed, right? Um, so I, um, I've been trying to figure out a way and talking to a lot of people about this still, it's still moving target, but about instead of renting, trying to put some money uh, into actually making um, not only temporary barriers, but you know, always barriers on the tracks sides to prevent people from running into the tracks, which is the longest part of the rental, uh, the, the, the barriers that we rent every uh, every summer. So to me, I prefer, I, I, I would like this council to fund that, uh, or at least to put some money, you know, it costs about $100,000 to do it on the weekends only, just rent it. Um, I would like us to put $150,000 into a separate, you know, as a placeholder to to see if we can actually what we can do with one hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars to actually uh, create those barriers right across the street here from the city hall, we have these cables that they are preventing people from crossing the block in the middle of the block right like into the tracks lines that will help a lot into making it main street a more pedestrian friendly uh, place. Uh, without changing the typology of the street. I'm talking about millions and millions of dollars. And I think, you know, that's something that we need to start moving forward instead of every year trying to figure out money to rent this and who's running it. And Downtown Alliance says that they might not do it this year. So I, I want us to move the needle on this. Could I respond to Council Members Pui? Yes, uh, please, Lorena. Th thank you. I, I actually have been getting some really good feedback, and I appreciate um, Cindy raising this issue, the concern of uh, now having wonderful activities downtown. Um, and I just wanted to say that um, I appreciate that feedback, as your constituents provide that feedback to the council office. Um, one of the things that we're doing, we're going to be meeting with the Downtown Alliance uh, within the next couple of weeks to ensure that Maybe there's a plan moving forward. I don't know what it will look like, but addressing the issue because in as much as the study is something that needs to happen and it's going to be a great part of our due diligence, um, if there would be, if Main Street were to become a pedestrian mall, we also need to ensure uh, that people don't forget about downtown. And because of that feedback that I believe many constituents have provided to uh, the council's office, we're going to be meeting and trying hopefully have something that we can bring back to you as options and maybe the downtown alliance can provide those options. So I just wanted to let you know that that is going to be happening. Thank you, Lorena. So, uh, what can, sorry, Mr. Chair. So, Go ahead, Council so Member, Council Member Pui is saying instead of 500,000, let's do 150, but to uh, buy permanent, the permanent barriers? I mean, I would like us to put $150,000 on a placeholder to put that permanent barrier on around the tracks line okay. for a couple blocks at least and see how far $150,000 okay. go to instead of every year renting yeah. these barriers. Uh, yeah. They, I, we saw something in Cincinnati. I don't know if you guys saw. No, it wasn't for the train, but also actually for mm -hmm. the street. I talked to John Larson about it, too, and I think I want that, too, because the ones that we're using are different and maybe are not very nice looking, but the ones that we saw in Cincinnati were nice and easy to transport and also very, well, anyway, yeah, all of same. the things. I so. think I just I agree with what Councilmember Pui is saying, I think the better, but what Councilmember Baltimore is saying is that they have these ballards that were better that you could like lock into place. Even if we could only do that on one block at a time and we each year we invest in adding another block, right. I think that would make a lot more sense than and expanding the program than, than renting the barricades every year and having the problems that we have with the barricades where people don't where people move them and people um, don't know that they're there, that they're temporary, and so they start to walk, and then people are going around them. I, th I think the Ballards are, are, would be a better investment, even if we can only do two of them, or two ends of the street. I don't know about it. Uh, I have a, so any more questions? I, I agree with that. I, I, think, I think even if understanding that we had some leeway during the pandemic and we all wanted to do that, I think that this is hopefully there are a lot of things from the pandemic that we learned that we can continue to do in perpetuity and this is one but it seems like there's pretty wide support for not just from council members but from the public so 
I, and I also agree we want to do it right and do it nice so it's it's not something we're renting all the time but it's something that we just have because we know we're going to do it every year so however that looks let's let's try and find a path through that so in that note I'm I'm supportive of I1 which is adding the $500,000 I know that's a placeholder number but like just how far can we get with that but one more question I, I was I understand that there have been some concerns or some people have raised concerns about liability issues is that something we need to address or is that not a I have heard that there there were some small concerns about liability uh, from the downtown alliance but I think we can learn the details of what okay. the concerns are after we meet with them would that be okay that would be great yeah I yeah. just hope that it's not something we're overlooking and is going to be a huge problem but uh, it seemed to me when I was I, I didn't get the details but it seemed like it was something we could okay. find a path through and I'm hoping that we can find a path through and I'm seeing head nods that I think the all majority or all of us would like to find a path through this so um so for me that's a, a support on both a11 and i1 right i don't know that we need to straw poll because we're only straw polling those first three right thank you thank you for thank you. thank you for that added ben sorry to derail the conversation um <laughs> we don't uh, just councilman we don't have to get through this whole list today right we we have this plan for to come back on the 14th. So we don't have to get through this list today. So if there are things you'd like to, to discuss a little more, there's some time. But Ben, go ahead to the next item. So the next item is D1. Uh, just a quick note, with interest rates going up, uh, sometimes that has benefits for the city. This item is recognizing $600,000 of interest income from bond proceeds that are in city accounts. That $600,000 will go to reconstruct more city streets. Yay. The next, yeah. <laughs> the next item is D3. It's 300 West. Uh, this is also an item that's uh, a pleasant surprise. The reconstruction is coming in over $2 million under budget. And the proposal is to take that $2 million and make it available for other street reconstructions. Uh, we're working with engineering to get an updated list of which streets this may go to. Uh, since the list that was included in the transmittal most of those streets have already been reconstructed. So in the updated staff report, we'll include the updated list. And Ben, um, ben sorry, Councilman, Mr. Chair. Go ahead, Councilman Dugan. So Ben, on the streets you're picking, are they just picking the streets off their, uh, their plan moving forward, the 2025 plan of uh, street reconstruction plan, those streets, or are they just picking yeah, different it, ones? You're correct. It's engineers' uh, six-year pavement plan where they lay out uh, which sections of local streets are to be reconstructed, and then the major arterials as well. So really, they're just using that those that street list for this portion, taking this money to to go to that. That's my understanding. Okay, thanks. Okay. Uh, the rest of the items in section D are some standard housekeeping items. Um, I think we can jump to E1. Uh, this is $4 million in additional funding from the U.S. Treasury for, emergen for their emergency rental assistance program. Uh, we've gotten over $23 million through this program. The Treasury considers Salt Lake City a high-performing city in getting these rental assistance dollars out to tenants. The administration is proposing to split the $4 million into two separate uses. $2 million for rental assistance and the other $2 million to go through a public competitive application process to fund housing stability services that are provided by the community-based organizations. 
And there's a variety of things that fall under the category of housing stability services. They're listed in the staff report. Some quick examples, uh, eviction prevention, case management, mediation, legal assistance. The city partnered with the state to get the earlier $23 million out to renters. This is the rentrelief.utah.gov website that we've been trying to spread the word about for the last two years. They have stopped accepting applications as of February 5th. So the $2 million proposed to go for rental assistance would fund applications that were submitted before the deadline, but not new applications. My understanding is the state has said they do not want to reopen uh, the application window, and they don't want to take more than $2 million from these additional funds to get through the applications that were submitted before the deadline. There's two policy questions. Uh, the council may want to discuss how to prioritize this $4 million. Do you support the split $2 million for rent assistance and the other $2 million for housing stability services? Or do you want to look at other options? And the other question is, does the council want to delegate authority to the administration to make final funding awards? Or as is typically the case, the advisory board and mayor make recommendations, but the council makes the final funding decision. Because that went really well earlier. Why am I getting, why am I getting <laughs> so much deja vu right now? Uh, ben, on this one, just to clarify, because it sounds very similar to the thing we talked about an hour ago, this is entirely different than that 1.5 and 1 1.5 that was going to be for housing development and rental assistance. This is now 4 million, two of which would be rental assistance similar to what we talked about earlier today and $2 million for housing st services, stability services, which are the thing, the other thing that we did not fund in, or that we're proposing to not fund in that previous discussion. Am I understanding that correct? That's correct. Okay. So The other important difference is the $3.5 million from earlier, those are HUD funds. Yeah. So those have a whole host of strings that these four million from the treasury do not. Okay. Um, but the you had that chart previously that was like, here's the difference between tenant-based rental assistance and whatever things, and there was like a yes, no, red, green thing. We're talking about those two columns now and splitting this four million dollars evenly between those two columns, or are those slightly different definitions still? So I think this is where I'd want to take more time to make okay. sure that housing stability services for treasury has see. the same or different definition for housing stability services for HUD. Okay, very okay. high level though. We're thinking There's about it definition. the correct way, but yeah. there may be some specific. Council members, I think this is worth discussing a little bit. Council member Dugan? I agree. I'm not sure if this is... Oh yeah, may, may we invite can oh, staff be, or whoever yeah. may be feel they have expertise in this area to come join us at the table, Blake and Tammy? I'm just, just cognizant of the time and how long we want to have this discussion because this could be. So our next item is scheduled at 520, so we still have time. Um, so the proposal in the budget amendment is $4 million to split evenly between rental assistance and how how's I keep I keep forgetting and support things <laughs> can you help us through this Tammy or Blake yes um, we could send additional information through a follow-up email but in general it's my understanding because there is that limit with the two million on what can be used for rental assistance with the the timeliness issue at hand that we're proposing the second two million to be used for housing stability services broadly defined to any of the services and programs that housing stability has been administering um, 
through their shop, um, but that could definitely be narrowed down by the council. Is that correct? Yeah, can I add uh, sure. a little bit come more? On. Yeah, come on up to the table so that the, the public can hear Eric. you. Yeah, I appreciate Hello, that. Hello, expert. What is Eric your name? Romberg. I'm a grant specialist with the Housing Stability Division. So the division here is $2 million for the Department of Workforce Services Rental Assistance Program. That's the rentrelief.utah.gov. They've actually already spent a lot of this money. I have an invoice that's ready as soon as the city's willing to pay it for rental assistance that's already gone out the door. And then the other $2 million, um, so the city can decide whether to approve that or not. Uh, we've just had a really good working relationship with the rent relief program there. So but what if we say no? We could. Uh, then right now they're projecting about a $12 million shortfall on rental assistance statewide. And so if we say no, that will go up to a $14 million shortfall for their projection. Um, so that's up to the city council to decide. They need Mary Beth. Yeah. And then right. the additional $2 million for housing stability services is really broad. It doesn't follow the same HUD definition there. So that's, that's all I wanted to add from, from that. Is this really confusing? It, it's a little confusing. Uh, it reminds me of rebudgeting. <laughs> okay, let's not open that one again. <laughs> but wait, so the, the Department of Workforce Services has already provided rent assistance to those who qualify, mm -hmm. but they've provided more than... So this is not new people that would be served. This is backfilling a gap that they have already created by serving people to date. So they received applications up until February 5th in their portal, and they have far more applications than they'll possibly be able to fulfill. Uh, so we're just kind of helping fill that gap. And so that money has not gone out the door. Okay. So they haven't spent money they don't have, but they have applications mm -hmm. for money. So the 14 million would be if they were to be able to fill mm -hmm. the entire gap that's their projection okay so yeah. there's a 14 million dollar gap we are proposing with this to pro that's, that's statewide. statewide but we're proposing with this to put two million dollars towards salt lake city's residents that fall in that gap tony you had a finger up yeah thanks chair and it is it's definitely confusing especially with the partnership that we've had with the state with the county all funds spent to date are the county and the state so not city funds the only city funds that have been spent that have been committed are have been through the council so these would be additional to then cover those who are still receiving benefits and this would be for salt lake city residents not just the entire statewide pool okay councilman dugan no anyone else I, okay, and the, but the, there's a limit of $2 million for that per Treasury guidelines, which is why the other $2 million is going to stability services. So that's something with in, in partnership with the state having to kind of make that forecast to say, all right, we have to close all the other money is closing. We have to basically say, Salt Lake City, if you'd like to give us $2 million, we'll serve those residents and we'll set that aside. We'll put that into our calculation. And we asked, we said, what can we put in more? And they said, we're only going to be able to budget because we have to then actually exit and finish off this program. Oh, so they're saying they probably could not use more than $2 million. It, There's not like a guideline that says, or a law that says we cannot allocate more than that, but it just may not go, may go unused. What about the $1.5 million from the previous discussion? That's already calculated in this, or that goes to a different place? The, HUD. the separate, the, those are separate. That doesn't go to workforce services. That's a rent relief program through someone entirely different. Oh, it is confusing. Okay. Yeah, and I, I do think, Eric, is that right? Okay, help me because I think you said at first the state had already helped these renters, which would be great, be fine, and then this would help cover that cost. Is that correct, or is it that they have all these applications and it would allow them to fund those applications? So the way that the state kind of distributes the funds between the county, the city, and themselves is kind of confusing, and I wouldn't want to get really into the, the weeds there. Uh, but essentially, they have the applications there. They're ready to fund those households. Okay, but they haven't funded them yet. No. No, the, there's applications there. Okay, um, so but if these, qualified people yeah. have gotten their assistance yet, 
and if Salt Lake City puts in this this two million dollars, then two million dollars worth of assistance would go out the door of the state. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? I'm sorry. If I may add, and um, Mary Beth and Tony can confirm this, that there actually isn't a contract executed until after city council approval. So, is this an item where I mean, an individual facing eviction could two weeks can be the difference between being evicted or not. Is this an item where if we straw hold it tonight, that could happen faster? Um, I, I defer to Mary Beth whether, I don't know if we can execute a contract based on a straw poll. The problem is not executing the contract. The problem is, is that housing stability then has to front load that money prior to adopting the budget. And I don't know if they have $2 million to front load in order to pay as they move forward. I see. Because a straw poll is not binding, and so I can't put a budget in there. They could just go and say, oh, we have $2 million over here. That we really which, think we're going to get. Right, which they don't necessarily have. But that's have. A too big of a number to It's a, it's a big with. number, okay. too, for them to dedicate funding from another source. Well, council members, I would like this to go as fast as possible, so the instruction, I guess, would be whatever the quickest thing to do to get that money out the door let's do it. And so I guess in that I'm saying I, I would support this $2 million and understand. And if the state can only take $2 million and the other $2 million going to the other services doesn't seem like a bad idea to me. Anyone disagree with that? A future motion where you could just say we approve budget amendment five for items, you know, E1, ABC, whatever. It, so we have a public hearing scheduled on this tonight, but we're, the plan was to continue that because there's some other items that may be related to other discussions that are happening that we would want to add into this rather than wait for budget amendment number six or the general budget. We're not allowed to adopt part of it and then continue. Yes, you are. So we could theoretically straw poll this now, take public comment, and adopt this piece tonight. You could. Yes, you could adopt. Actually could. We hadn't thought yeah. of it, but you, yeah. Could. Yeah, you could. could. I would like to do that. You could, okay. you could do that, and the, if you wanted to, the, the other three items that we had straw polled. Okay, so I will straw poll that we support item G1. G1. E1. E1. Just this one. Okay, so I will straw poll that we support item E1 and that we move that forward with potential adoption tonight pending public comment. That is seven to zero. Can I ask a question again? Uh, yes, Cindy has a question. Um, on the uh, other housing assistance programs that the other part of this money would go to, is that the batch of programs that the council hasn't been totally briefed on yet. It would be putting two million more into those programs, is that right? Yes, we would need to come back. If the council's interested in that route, we could definitely come back with a more narrow proposal so the council is clearly aware of what those funds would be used for and how they would be approved. They would, uh, I'll defer to Tony, but I think obviously they'd have to fit into the ERAP um, program parameters, right, Tony? Yep, exactly. Okay, so they would, so it, and there's already quite a bit of money there that you, that has been handled in the account numbers that you refer to, Mary Beth, the grant funding stuff. So this would be, in addition, would it be appropriated to those grant accounts or somewhere else? We don't have to talk about that now. Well, let's talk about that later. Okay. I just want to make sure that when we make that motion that we're not delegating the authority yet for this other $2 million to anybody at this time. I'm looking at policy question number two on the uh, staff report about delegating authority for the final funding decision for the other $2 million. Okay, so clarification of the straw poll would be that the $2 million for rental assistance that will go to workforce services is determined and if we approve it tonight this contract can be signed but the other two million 
are we just we you only want to show pull show pull the first yeah, two million? Yeah. Okay, so let me re change my straw pull. Well, didn't 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 we just straw pull it and say two million? Out I the think door? I said all of E two or E one, which was both two million, so four million. So I'll propose another straw poll. What, what do you? How do I do this? <laughs> Undo the straw. No, poll I think or? I think. I think you were clear that what you want is for the money that would go to okay. the backlog of rental uh, assistance. But the other the two state. million is it'll not go through the regular process. Yet. Yeah. Okay. Which will take. Does everyone? Another. No one. Everyone agrees with that. Just the two million. For, okay. Thank you. Thanks for letting us clarify. Mr. Chair. Yeah. I would like to, uh, you know, bring about to this to this uh, council a council added uh, item uh, for two hundred thousand dollars for code enforcement uh, that will uh, pay for two, uh, you know, which is the guest from our side of of the aisle for two code enforcement additional code enforcement uh, people for the city. Uh, we have learned quite a bit through the discussion. Uh, through the discussion of ADUs, but not only on ADUs, about the lack of or the poor uh, code enforcement uh, that we, we have. And I think adding two more uh, code enforcement um, people to our city will make, uh, will make a big difference. So $200,000 for two code enforcement uh, people. So, Mr. Chair, can I? Uh, go ahead, Councilman Fowler. Why can't we do that at the, in the budget? Why do we need to do that in a budget amendment right now? You just told me that uh, we can do whatever we want to, L like literally okay. one minute ago. But my, but that doesn't answer my question. It's just because you want to in the budget amendment? No, I, I think it's an, very much in response of the feedback that we have had and waiting. Uh, waiting uh, means a lot of time for the implementation. We still discuss even today uh, about things that uh, were approved in last budget uh, that have not been implemented by the administration. So I want to make sure that they understand that this is a priority of this board, of this council. Uh, the code enforcement has been uh, the main issue. That I think that the overwhelming issue is that code enforcement is not quite funded correctly. I want to make sure that this we say that right now. Uh, I just, oh. you, if I may, I, everyone here knows how I feel about budget amendments, and I think that adding FTEs is fine. I feel good about adding, you know, looking at the budget when we're in regular budget cycle and looking at what is proposed and what we need and waiting for that regular budget cycle. That's just a philosophical thing for me generally as budget amendments go. And I'll, I'll, I'll add up to this. I, I agree that it, in Typically, I would like to do that. I think the reason why this feels urgent to me now is because of the ADU amendments, which there's a strong feeling from many people in the public that that will increase code enforcement needs, response needs. And so doing it, not waiting until the general budget, there would be a lag. And this would decrease the lag between if it's true that the ADU ordinance may increase those, those needs for code enforcement. Um, I'll, I'll also add that that's the thing I was alluding to, at least one of them, as to why we are going to, we are, our intent, the intent is to hold open the public hearing tonight because since it's not listed, tell me if I'm wrong, but since it's not listed here, we need to have another public hearing date so that the public, it can be listed on a piece of paper that the public can read and then come to comment on. So, so we could not adopt that one we have to have another public hearing if we want to add things that are not on this list. Is that, that correct? That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's why. And it's not hard. You've done it before. Yeah. Mr. Chair, if I Go ahead, may. Councilman Fowler. Um, I don't disagree that changing the ADU ordinance, it, I don't disagree that we may need more compliance officers for a number of different reasons. I just don't know if we change the ordinance, even if like we adopted a new ordinance today, is somebody going to build an ADU within the next month? Are, are, are there going to be so many ADUs then built because we've changed the ordinance such that if we don't wait for the regular budget cycle, which we will have to have, is like we could hire compliance people in September, let's say, if we waited for the regular budget cycle. 
I guess the concern is the number of days it takes for a person, I, I mean, I guess I would conceptualize as the number of days it takes for a person to say, okay, the ADU ordinance was passed, I'm gonna plan, design, and start building my ADU. It probably isn't that different from the number of days it takes for staff to like post and hire and train a new person. So I think both of those things take some time. And I, I would rather do them. The, my other, the other reason why I, I think that is, is because I think because we're having this discussion about ADUs right now, we're all intent on adding capacity to that. And I don't know if that will wane in a few months when other things, shiny objects, make us forget the commitments that we have made or have discussed making. Mr. Chair. Councilor Mpui. So I, I will say most of the things that we have heard so far as far as uh, compliance, you know, the relate to ADU or not, there are issues about our compliance capacity. You know, we have heard so much. Even if we have not ch make zero changes on ADUs, I think the general agreement from the public comment, from the public feedback is that this city doesn't, we could do better on compliance. So regardless of if we change or anything on ADUs, we need to do this. Uh, and I think it makes the argument even stronger about the commitment from this board, from this council about tackling the compliance issue uh, that everybody agrees with. Even people, whatever we are on the ADU place, I think the compliance issue is a gener very generic agreement. Councilor Dugan. Mr. Chair, I, I, I'm just saying I, I'm open to the idea of adding Councilmember Pui's uh, recommendation to have a compliance line on the budget, amendment number five. Is that, and, and that's what, how I'm gathering this, but we need to put that on, a, on the staffing document so we can have it in the public eye, so we can discuss it at the public. So yeah, it would be a change to budget am amendment number five, and because we're changing budget amendment number five, we would have to Tonight cannot be the only public hearing. Right. We'd have to have a second uh, public. We'd have to have another public hearing or and we, and open the public hearing. Right. And I can see that anyways because we probably won't go through this full list that we may have. A I second. don't think we will. Yeah. So I'm, uh, I'm open to that. So I'd like to continue on with what we have on the, on the uh, document here. And then, and then we have an open, we can add that to the. So you're saying five. go back to this list, but let's discuss this at well, the I, next I will, I will suggest it to, for this council to straw all it. And uh, then you said that we need to cl close this very soon. This co the uh, 520 is when the next item is here, but I do think I see the applicant in the audience, so they're already here ready to go. So, uh, may, may I ask, are you okay waiting until 519 if we're not finished to, dis to discuss more of this? Or uh, I could just ask. I mean, are you asking to do a straw poll? I don't to think put there's on? a difference between us, because we're going to discuss budget amendment number five next week okay. again. So I, I don't know that. I, I don't know that there's a difference, right? Yeah. Council Member Wharton, did you have a comment? Um, just that I'm sorry I missed the first part of this, so I hope I don't. I can cut you up if you want me to say something and miss with being only half informed, but I'm going to go for it anyway. Um, I am very, very committed to improving um, compliance and would would be interested in looking at all, a lot of different changes um, to to sort of beef that up based on information that we've heard from residents. Um, but I don't want to, like we're about to have a very big ADU discussion and compliance is part of that. And I don't want, I don't think it's fair for either of us to be holding that over the ADU discussion. Um, and well, so unless there's a reason for us to do that like right now, as opposed to during the normal budget process, um, I think everybody's in agreement that we want to have more compliance. So, but I think that we should have the ADU discussion and not have this hanging over the head, our heads while we have it. Does that make do so? Do we have to make a decision on that right now? I think. Wait, I'm not actually. I'm not sure what you're saying. You're saying. Okay. You agree with Councilor Fowler to wait till the public, till the budget season, or are you saying? Because I could see that go, going. As of right now, like, is there a reason why we need to beef up compliance from May, March to May, 
um, when we're all in agreement that we need to beef up compliance and when, when compliance is a big part of the ADU discussion that we're going to have and that we don't know quite where that's going to go, at least I don't. I don't either. Um, I would prefer to not add to the pressure of that discussion. So, uh, I, I th so not discussing compliance in relation to the ADU discussion later in the two agenda items? Is that what you're asking? I guess I'm saying, what is the reason why we would need to add two compliance officers from March to May? It seems like the Sorry, contemplation sure. of them, I'm not advocating necessarily that we have to, but the contemplation for them is that we have been engaging with so many constituents, huh. ADU ordinance being the impetus for that engagement. And the refrain is that there is broken trust with the city and its constituents around the issue of enforcement. And that message has been repeated so consistently that as we currently have a budget opening, the consideration of an emergent addition of enforcement officers is a direct response, no matter what we do with the rest of the ADU ordinance or what, what conclusions we come to, that that refrain has been so consistent from so many constituents that our immediate consideration of them while we have this budget opening is demonstrating that we are hearing constituents and responding to them. I, I hear what you're saying about it, but that is, that appears to be the justification for why we would do it now. Right, but, but we At have, least the consideration element. I mean, we have a lot of really urgent needs right now. Um, and we still go through the normal budget process unless there's a reason why something can't wait. Mr. Chair, right, I, I, I will say that this, I mean, I don't know how many emails you've gotten, but I've gotten a lot of emails, and most of them are saying compliance is a big problem. And I think uh, regardless of the ADU, if we change it or not, this is listening to this, this is actually responding to that concern, pushing it away. Uh, when we are talking about it, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of budget it, and not showing the urgency on this matter is what I'm trying to answer to. This, regardless of what, how this, and I think that this is a ton cost on the ADU. This is beyond that. I think there is, a, there is a hole there that we need to answer, and I, you know, regardless if changes or not. And I think there is urgency. And I also want to rem remember uh, that Council members don't want to uh, make changes right now on budget amendment suggested making budget amendments. Hence, we talked about this in the past, right? Like, we do it this sometimes, and sometimes we do it for something that we care, sometimes we don't. Sometimes we don't care about the item. But the tool is there, and I think it shows that there is an urgency for this, and we're responding to it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask that we move on for today, um, and we can discuss this again next week. I think having a straw poll right now would probably not be, I, I think council members need a little more time to sit with the idea before we ask them to straw poll. So if that's all right with you, I think we should wait until next week to pick up this discussion again. Um, it is 517. So I would propose that we end this agenda item now and pick up the rest of the list next week on the 14th. Is that all right with everybody? Okay, thank you. Does anyone need an, an additional break, or should we? Okay, a short break. Three, five minutes. Five minute bathroom break. <laughs> to get started, we are back to agenda item number three, which we skipped. That is a rezone and master plan amendment at 865 South, 500 East. At the table, we have Brian Fulmer, Council Policy Analyst, Michael McNamee is with us virtually, Nick Norris, Planning Director, and Kelsey Lindquist are also here as well, and I believe the applicant is also here. Go ahead, Brian, with an introduction. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is a proposal to amend the zoning map for the parcel at 865 South 500 East from its current RMF 30 zoning designation to CN, or Neighborhood Commercial. The proposal would also amend the Central Community Master Plan future land use map from low density residential to neighborhood commercial. The petitioner's stated objective is to convert the single family residential structure to an unspecified commercial use. And with that, I'll turn it over to Michael. Thanks, Brian. Michael, Thanks, Brian. you're up. Uh, 
Good evening. Um, this is a proposed rezone and master plan amendment for the property at 865 South 500 East. Uh, next slide, please. The subject property is located just north of the intersection at 500 East and 900 South on the east side of the street. It is currently zoned RMF 30 or low density multifamily residential district. The applicant is proposing to amend the zoning map so that this property would be located in the CN or neighborhood commercial district. He's also proposing to amend the central community master plan, which this property is located within. The future land use map in the plan designates this property as low density residential. And the applicant would like to amend the map so that this property would be designated as neighborhood commercial. This would be done in order to support his rezone request. The stated goal of the applicant is to convert the structure on the property, which is currently a single family dwelling, into a commercial use that would be allowed in the CN zone. Staff recommended to the Planning Commission that they forward a negative recommendation to the City Council. The Commission ultimately forwarded a positive recommendation, the reasons for which will be discussed later in this presentation. Next slide. The subject property contains a single family home that was constructed in 1905. The home is located within and listed as a contributing structure to the Central City Local Historic District. City records indicate that this property has likely been used as, as a single family dwelling since 1905, as there are no permits or other city approvals that demonstrate any other use. Because of the building status as a contributing structure, demolition or exterior modifications would need to be approved via a certificate of appropriateness by planning staff or the Historic Landmark Commission. The proposed rezone would not impact the building's contributing status. Next slide, please. This property is situated on a block of 500 East that is primarily defined by residential uses, generally single and two family dwellings and small multifamily buildings. Liberty Park is located within close proximity. Directly to the west is a 70 unit apartment building, which is the largest structure in the immediate area. The two properties to the south contain a restaurant and a butcher shop. These properties plus a third property on 900 South that is used as a dwelling are zone CN. So the proposed rezone would expand the footprint of the CN zone and extend it to the interior of the block on 500 East. In general, properties along the 900 South corridor are zone CN, RB, the residential business district or RMF 30. To the north of 900 South, the interior of the blocks are generally zoned RMF 30, including the block of 500 East, which contains the subject property. If approved, this rezone would be the first example in the immediate area of a property on the interior of a block being zoned for commercial. The zoning ordinance limits the size of a contiguous area of CN zoning to 90,000 square feet. With the subject property included, the total area of contiguous CN zoning at this location would be about 29,523 square feet. Next slide, please. RMF 30 and CN differ primarily in the types of uses permitted in each district. RMF 30 allows for single, two, and multifamily dwellings, depending on the size of the lot. It does not allow for commercial uses, although it does permit non-residential uses that are incidental to residential neighborhoods, such as community gardens, daycares, or parks. By contrast, CN does not permit residential as a standalone use. Residential is only permitted as part of a mixed-use development. CN does allow for many different types of commercial development, which are intended to be compatible with residential neighborhoods and scale. Examples of allowed uses include retail goods and services, restaurants, and offices. Development standards between the two districts are similar, although CN generally is more permissive, allowing for more lot coverage and smaller setbacks. Maximum building height, however, is shorter in CN at 25 feet compared to RMF 30, which allows for 30 feet. Remapping the property to CN would introduce landscape buffering requirements because the neighboring properties to the north and east are zoned for residential. A seven foot landscaping buffer is required when abutting a residential district and parking lot perimeter landscaping is required when the parking is located within 20 feet of a lot line or in a required yard. However, it should be noted that these requirements would only be applicable to new construction and an expansion of the building or a reconfiguration of the parking area. 
They would not apply to the existing building and parking area if they were left alone. Next slide, please. A number of adopted city plans and policies are applicable to the proposed project. Plan Salt Lake is the citywide master plan, and this property is located in the central community neighborhood plan area. Because of the property's location in a local historic district, the city's preservation plan also applies. And because the proposal would involve replacing a housing unit with a non-residential use, the city's housing plan growing SLC is applicable as well. In general, the proposed rezone is not supported by the applicable plans and policies excuse me, applicable plans and policies. The central community master plan in particular contains a land use policy that specifically states that low density residential areas should be preserved and the city should keep them from being replaced by commercial uses and higher density residential. Several specific goals and initiatives in growing SLC are not supportive of the proposed amendment. Plan Salt Lake is more mixed with some guiding principles and initiatives in the neighborhoods, transportation and mobility and economy chapters being in support of the proposal while principles and initiatives in the housing and parks and recreation chapters were not supportive. The community preservation plan is supportive of, adap of adaptive reuse where it creates more housing units, but it's not in outright support of converting housing to non-residential use. Some policies in the plan may offer support for a project that converted a housing unit to non-residential if the structure were not significantly altered and negative impacts were mitigated. Next slide, please. Because this application involves a zoning change that would permit non-residential use of land, it is subject to the city's housing loss mitigation ordinance. Under the ordinance, there are three potential options to mitigate the loss of existing housing units. One is to build replacement housing. The second is to pay a fee based on the difference between housing value and replacement cost. And the third is to pay a flat fee if the housing units are deteriorated. These options were explored with the applicant and paying a fee based on the difference between housing value and replacement cost was identified as the most feasible option. The full housing loss mitigation report is attached to the staff report as attachment H. Next slide, please. The application was presented to the Planning Commission at their October 26th, 2022 hearing. Uh, the commission recommended that the, that the council approve the rezone they supported the rezone because they believe the request is consistent with the city's goals of increasing bikeability and walkability, that it would contribute to improved air quality, and because it would make denser housing in the area more pleasant. Uh, next slide, please. Staff has received five emails and discussed this application over the phone with several people as of the date of this briefing. Comments received were generally mixed between supporting the proposal and expressing concerns. Comments in support of the application indicated they believed a new commercial business would help support the walkability and vibrancy of the neighborhood. Those expressing apprehension were generally concerned with the impact on on-street parking, privacy, and noise impacting the abutting residential area, as well as protecting the historic integrity of the building. Next slide. Next slide, please. Scott, is there another slide? Well, that's um, the next slide was just yeah, the end cap. Okay. So that uh, concludes my presentation. Um, I'm happy to take any questions at this time. Um, I'm told the applicant may have some additional information that they'd like to share prior to our discussion. Is that true? Uh, you want to come up to the table? And per our policy, you have five minutes to uh, address the council. Uh, either way. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, I appreciate uh, the time. Uh, my name is Rick Service. I'm the owner of the property. Make sure you speak really close. These okay, microphones sorry. aren't great. Yeah, thank you. My name is Rick Service. I'm the owner of the property. Um, I've owned the property maybe 10 years, something like that. When I bought it, um, it was the old, if you can, anyone can remember, there's that blue dilapidated gas station that was on the corner, and then there was, the, uh, there was this house, and there, there's the house um, to the north uh, on 900, on, to the east, I'm sorry, on 900 south. I bought all three of those parcels. Uh, the corner, we took the old gas station and turned it into tradition, um, restaurant and then um, 
on going east on 900 South, took the old, the old house that someone did live in and turned it into Beltex Meats. Um, so I've wanted to, uh, I, I feel like we did a really good job on those two parcels and I really just wanted to uh, uh, fix the other parcel up. Similar, I, in my opinion, it balances off the corner. Um, there's a lot of other things too, um, but I, I think that it will add to the walkability, it'll add to commerce, um, it'll, I just think it'll add, and truthfully, it gives me a chance really to fix up the building. Now, obviously, I could fix up the building even if this didn't happen, but you know, it makes it a, a, a chance for me to take the building and turn it into something you know, that it's not. I think it'll be turning into something cool. So any, I don't know what else to say. Uh, council members, discussion. Um, Mr. Service, you and I have just talked about this before and one of the concerns that was brought up in, in Michael's presentation. I would love to, do we have them? Oh, I related. guess there are some slides. One, one hurdle. Oh, go ahead. Okay, I'm sorry. Thank you. One hurdle that um, I had was. And I was. <laughs> okay, yeah. One hurdle that I had was um, just we were taking a residential component out of the city by making that a commercial unit. And so with the, with the um, new ADU ordinances, um, we feel like we can build an ADU in the back, so a separate unit in the back to house someone that will equal out the um, residents in the in the community and I think I have some slides just showing some temporary drawings that that we drew I'm not sure staff do we have those send them to Michael but maybe thank you Scott okay yeah okay that's the first one it's just aerial and you can see um, the the existing home and then there's a new home in the back. There is space for the home in the back. Kelsey? Yeah, if I may, um, if the council is interested in the addition of an ADU um, in conjunction with the rezone of this property, that would trigger the buffer yard requirement of seven feet and accessory structures are not permitted to be located within the buffer yard so a, a development agreement would be required to eliminate that requirement of a buffer yard if the council is interested in exploring the ADU option oh so you're saying this in the proposed ADU ordinance which we have not yet adopted that would still there would be a seven foot requirement because it's a buffer What's because the of the neighborhood commercial district requirements so CN requires a buffer yard to uh, lower intensity uses, and that would include the RMF 30, which is that's interesting surrounding this property. Um, so, so even though an ADU would be allowed that would be within three feet of a side yard setback in the proposed ordinance, because this is a commercial adjacent to a residential even though it's multifamily residential, that setback reduction would be eliminated because the buffer would take precedence over the base setback. Am I understanding that Nick's committing That's in correct. that? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Accessory structures are not permitted within the seven foot buffer yard. And ADUs uh, are technically this an is accessory a really good, structure. Um, and just to be clear, this would not be allowed right now. If we do not adopt the ordinance, you cannot put an ADU on a commercial use. Is that, am I understanding That's that correct. If you were to rezone this property to CN. And um, not adopt the ADU ordinance, the ADU would not be allowed. This is only something that could be allowed under the proposed ordinance, mm -hmm. which is, oh, that's really interesting. I, I mean, I don't think that we should have added requirements on an ADU that, if we're allowing something when a single family house abuts another single family house for an ADU, I'm not sure why we would, maybe, maybe I'm just need to, I'm thinking this out loud, but what would be the, the justification for requiring additional setbacks, even though it's a 
use that would be allowed if it were a single family zone. Yeah, I, I don't think we anticipated the ADU triggering a, a buffer yard for commercial properties. And I think there would be a handful. Um, this wouldn't be every commercial property, right? Because, <laughs> because um, it's just the ones that abut the residential uses. And since this likely would be a change of use to a commercial use, that buffer yard Interesting. would be triggered with an ADU. Yeah. And in addition to that, if, if an ADU were built in a commercial zone, it can transfer to any other use that's allowed in that zone. And so that's why the buffer yard is there. There's, and there's so an you alleyway could build, too. You could build an ADU in a commercial zone and then you change it to... Any other allowed accessory use in that uh, zone. And, and sometimes that can be impactful when it's next to uh, uh, I mean, is it a development zone? agreement, the tool to say, if we reduce your setback, this must stay as an ADU in perpetuity and not convert to a commercial use? which would also accomplish the goal of keeping a residential use on the property. Right. And there's That's an correct. alley in the back too. There's an alley. Does that change things? The alley, there's not an alley. Is that correct? It's officially there is, but it's been uh, blocked off for about 20 years. And so there really isn't an alley there. But how, how, so sorry. Blocked <laughs> off versus vacated are different. It's so there's a, an alley on paper, but it has been blocked. Right. It's a non-functional alley. City asset. No, it is not a city. It's, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a private um, <laughs> alleyway. Um, and, you know, just an interesting side note is when I first purchased the property, I wanted to try to open up that alleyway because I thought it uh, would make more accessibility there. But um, there, the neighboring property has blocked it off for so long. I guess there's a law in Utah that if someone blocks a road off more than 20 years, why it can stay, it becomes their property, it can stay blocked off. So I wasn't able to get that opened. If I may, and hopefully I'm not overstepping, Michael, I can't, oh, I can see you. Okay, you're just in a small corner. Um, this property abuts RMF 30 on, on two sides, and that excludes the alley. So it abuts it to the east. There's a small lot, 517, and it also abuts RMF 30 to the north. So in 517 is a separate lot that does not front a public way, right? Mm -hmm. Am I saying that correctly? That's okay. correct. It's, it appears to be associated with the commercial property that fronts on it 900 is. south. It is kind of the story that that goes with that is a long time ago the people that owned my house apparently they got someone in the household got sick they had medical bills they had to pay them they were good friends with the people that owned 517 so five they sold 517 the back part of the of the property to pay off their medical bills now that wouldn't be a legal purchase today but you know 50 years ago it probably was yeah, thank you. Okay, council members, any additional questions on this? Um, okay, I, I, I'm, I like the idea of adding the ADU so that we're not losing a unit of housing in our city. Um, I also personally think that Neighborhood commercial is something that our neighborhoods benefit from, and I think tradition is a great example of a neighborhood business that I love going to when I can afford it. And um, I think it's a great... So I... If the ADU issue can be resolved and we can, at, can maintain that additional unit of housing, I like the idea of, of this request. But I'll just say that and we have a public hearing so additional public comment any other thoughts okay i think that's it thank you for coming thank you thank you thanks, thanks. for your help all right so that brings us to item number four 
Item number four is a follow-up discussion on our accessory dwelling unit text amendment. I think we have pretty much the same crew at the table. Um, Brian Fulmer, Council Policy Analyst, Michael McNamee, who is online, Nick Norris, Planning Director, and Kelsey Lindquist, Planning Manager. And the mayor is here as well. Um, do, do we go to the mayor first or Brian? Uh, mayor, go ahead, Mayor. Whichever way you would like to do it. Okay. This is Brian's house. <laughs> We're visiting. Thanks for giving me just a minute. I know that there's been a lot of machination about this ordinance update proposal, and I wanted to take a second to share with you, which I, I, I did share with the chair and vice chair in their meeting um, the last time we visited, that I am not in support of removing the owner occupancy on the residential components. Reason being that the updates that I, I hope will be passed that are included in here are, I believe, sufficient for us to move forward both the access for people to build ADUs in their properties and use their equity to create new streams of revenue and the number of ADU units in the city. But I believe that by adding in, or rather removing the owner occupancy requirement on the residential side, incentivizes corporate investment in our neighborhoods and actually disincentivizes the wealth building tool that this ADU and the improvements in it would otherwise be. I think in some ways it's actually antithetic to thriving in place, which is contemplating ways that we can increase wealth building and community stability in the neighborhoods and the residents that are already here. And when you make it easier for a corporate entity and a corporate investor to buy that house in that neighborhood and turn it into two for-profit residential units that we lose the neighborhood stability that would otherwise be easier to achieve with the ADU ordinance. So I just wanted to encourage you to accept what the Planning Commission recommended with regard to the owner occupancy component, which is also what the planning division forwarded. And I believe what our residents want to see left in place. The rest of it, I'm leaving it up to you, but I get, really appreciate you giving me a moment, given the changes in um, the conversation around this proposal to just have two cents. I appreciate it very much. Brian, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Brian, go ahead. Okay. At the after the public hearing on February seventh, some council members expressed interest in having additional work session discussion time, discussion time to consider other options, and potentially reconsider some of the straw polls which were taken at the February seventh work session. That's my introduction, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Okay. So. Um there are in the staff report several a list of several ideas. I understand there may be some new ideas that have come. Uh, most of them relate to the owner occupancy requirement, but not all. Um, can I just ask some clarifying questions first before we jump into these discussions? The owner occupancy requirement in the current proposal is um, proposed to be removed for commercial. So for instance, this project we just looked at where it's a commercial, say we have, that was approved, that's not yet, but say it was, if it was a commercial use with an ADU on it, that does not have to be owner occupied. Is, am I correct on that? What about um, the owner occupancy requirement I, in multifamily zones? So for a, for a duplex, multifamily dwelling or non-residential use, there is no owner occupied occupancy requirement. What about um, like, or, sing, yeah, what about that's right. single family attached in a multifamily zone? That would still be considered single family. So that's based on the use, not the zone. I think that's a key component. Can, okay, so can based you, on... Can you tell me, I mean, when you say that, so RMF 30, RMF 30, single family home on the RMF 30... Re under the proposed proposal as written requires owner occupancy. It requires owner occupancy on... A okay. single family home, even in an RMF zone. But if that RMF zone chooses to build a duplex, which would be allowed, they can then add an ADU and that does not need to be owner occupied. That's correct. 
So that seems okay. So, and then, so let me, let me maybe give some context for why that is. So if somebody is building a duplex, it's already inherently could be both sides rental, right? When they add an ADU, there's suddenly three units on it. So then technically it would qualify under, it would be very similar to one of our multifamily definitions, which is three units or more on a property. So that's kind of why we landed where we did with those exceptions to the owner occupancy. But it, so I guess the question is why, if instead of building a duplex, I'm in a, sing, in a multifamily zone and I choose to add an ADU to a single family house because maybe the geom geometry fits better in that case, I'm still required to maintain the owner occupancy requirement, even though I could go to a theoretically more intense use, which is a duplex rather than a single family house with an ADU. So part of that is that because duplexes, multifamily, things like that have different um, minimum lot areas and density requirements and things like that. And so um, if somebody has a big enough property to be able to, even in the new RMF 30 that goes into effect in April, um, if they have enough property to do that, then that policy that's been adopted is already allowing for full rental, um, understanding that that's a possibility and a reality, right? The ADU is a little bit different because we're not it requiring the increased in lot area for that additional unit. So can, I don't I, think I'm following. Just make it make sure I'm understanding this. So uh, whatever zoning you're in, if you have a single family home on that zoning lot, you're required to be owner occupancy if you want to have an ADU, and the, and the ADU and the zone, the the lot coverage still has to maintain within whatever the zoning uh, requirements are. Okay, so any single family home on any type of lot, owner occupancy for an ADU. Okay. Let me try to explain that a little bit further. So if you have, say you're in a zone where duplexes are allowed and you need 6,000 square feet for a duplex, but you have a property that of only land. has- Of land. But you only, your, your lot is only 5,000 square feet. You can't build a duplex, but you can add an ADU to that. And that is because we don't require additional land area for an ADU, where we do require additional land area for additional units. So there, there's a reason why the code, even current and proposed, considers, there's a statement in there that says an ADU is not considered a unit of density. And it's because of that reason. Otherwise, we'd end up having to add, to qualify, you'd have to have so much more land. And just just to take your lesson that you gave me when you uh, sent that email out, so it uh, still has to require the lot coverage, still is enforced for the ADU, but not the lot density. The lot size. And lot but, area per unit. But if there's a single family home in a multifamily zone and the lot is large enough to accommodate a duplex and they choose not to say it's like a large house in the middle of the lot, they choose not to tear that down, instead maintain that unit, but add an ADU in the back according to the ADU ordinance. Because they didn't turn that primary dwelling into a duplex, even though they could have, we're saying they must remain retain owner occupancy? It's because we're modifying the things like the set, setbacks in the rear yard and things like that for the ADU where we wouldn't for the I duplex. But we would allow those modifications but, for the ADU if they were to change the primary use into a duplex. If they choose to do that. So that... <laughs> I think yeah. what you're what's being demonstrated is how complex applying all of the various zoning regulations are and one of the reasons why we did it by the um, use and not the zone was for that very reason because it becomes very complicated when we have 
you know, we have 57 zoning districts and trying to come up with rules that apply in all, you know, maybe 48 of those allow residential uses. So if, if we trying to come up with rules that apply to 48 different zoning districts for something that is as small as an ADU well, is so really hard. Another goal of mine. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And that, I mean, that's one reason why our zoning code is complicated and why we have things like sometimes we have a buffer yard setback and sometimes we don't and sometimes we have all these other regulations and so this was an attempt to try to simplify the ADU regulations as, to make it as simple as possible of how they would apply I, okay I I okay councilmember Wharton my questions um, actually for Kimberly um, the attorney that's been working on this um, or one of um, so Kimberly, broadly speaking, what are the legal implications of removing the owner occupancy requirement entirely? What does that mean legally in Salt Lake City? So I'm Kimberly Chaitris with oh, the attorney's sorry. office. <laughs> That's okay. I just remembered I'm supposed to get on record there. And I am one of the attorneys who uh, works on this tangentially as well as, uh, well, a couple others in my office. So I think you're asking what is the effect of putting this on single family zoning, right? So making ADUs a permit, permitted citywide would make all single family residential properties with a single structure effectively multifamily in the fact that there would be two structures allowed on every lot. Is that what you're asking? Even though they're not units of density. So it's not a unit of density, as Nick just described, under the code. Mm -hmm. But it allows that additional unit because the ADU is allowed. Now, the state law already allows internal ADUs. Right. So there can always, already be two units housing units mm -hmm. on a property without changing the density if it's internal. But this would allow an external unit as well. Okay, so my understanding of the purpose of this whole ADU discussion from the beginning was to remove barriers and streamline the process, make it easier for approving ADUs, um, the biggest of which, according to our staff, biggest barrier of which was the conditional use permitting process. Removing owner occupancy, to me, feels like a policy shift rather than streamlining does that would that be legally accurate yes i think so there's two different those are two different topics so whether or not it's a conditional use permit has to do with the process and how it's reviewed mm -hmm. and then whether or not it's owner occupied is a condition to approval okay so if we were effectively doing away with single family single use structure zoning that sounds like a big change to me and probably the one of the biggest land use changes that I've seen on my time on the council. What would uh, the city's typical process be for that big of a land use change? Um, I, if I'm following you correctly, <laughs> I think that that would normally, maybe like oh, let's let Nick answer. The, it, it's the same process that this went through. So it starts with the required uh, community input, data gathering, all that kind of stuff. Um, our code requires a minimum of 45 day public input. We, for something like this, do more than that. Um, and a recommendation from the planning commission before ultimately, uh, after a public hearing, um, and then ultimately a city council decision. But when we changed RMF, didn't we give notice? Didn't we give additional notice to all of those properties? RMF 30? I think we initially provided notice to the RMF 30 property owners and tenants, but this would be citywide. Yeah. Um, and so we have different noticing requirements for citywide projects. So we would, so we normally, or so for RMF 30 change, we gave notice. It, that's a zone specific change. Right. Mm -hmm. But in this, we would not be giving that level of notice to everyone in the city. Right? Different notice. Oh, different notice. Yeah. Okay. So it was published on our website, open houses. Michael attended a number of community council meetings to go over these changes, briefing with planning commission, ultimate public hearing with planning commission, and then a transmittal. 
Okay, and but still that through that process, the recommendation was to keep owner occupancy. That's correct. Okay, so I'm also concerned about neighborhoods, Kimberly. So, if we remove the owner occupancy requirement, does that give the council more tools to shape the future of neighborhoods, or fewer tools legally? I think that depends on what you think happens when you have only owner occupied properties able to install an ADU on the property. So I think you're looking at weighing policy considerations mm -hmm. between the impact on a neighborhood. If you, I think arguably, if you allow any property to add an ADU regardless of occupancy, then there are more potential ADUs. And so then you're balancing the number of those potential ADUs against what you think is the impact on the community. Okay, well maybe this like will ex help. Because um, my concern is it's been suggested that if we remove owner occupancy and it doesn't produce the outcomes that we want, we could undo it. Um, but what would be the legal implications of doing something like that? How do we take back a property right that we've given? Well, the technical process I think would be the same as right now, which is you'd have to go through a zoning amendment, which is the whole process that they just described. Hmm. Um, I don't know that you like necessarily vest in, in a zone. Like, so when you buy property, if the zoning says one thing, um, you can legally do whatever you want with that property while that zone is in force. The zone can change through the process. And if you don't change your property, you become legally non-conforming. And so you could maintain the use that was legal when you put it in place. Mm -hmm. um, and then at some point in the future, if you wanted to change the use of your property, you could only change it consistent with what the current use of the zoning is. Okay. Can, can, is another way to say that zones zoning texts can become more restrictive but any uses built when it was less restrictive are become legal non-conforming uses yes okay yeah. so or grandfathered in is like the tech like the correct okay and then my like last question is about other than the current complaint process to code enforcement um, are there other ways that a property owner could be held accountable for city-imposed conditions on ADUs, such as owner occupancy or uh, prohibition on short-term rentals? So right now, it's enforced strictly through civil enforcement. Um, and it would depend on what you're probably trying to enforce. So if you're talking about enforcing owner occupancy, that also another implicated conversation is um, enforcement against short-term rentals, Yeah. right? And that's a concern that comes up with ADUs and how they'll be used. So if you are concerned about how the ADUs are used, um, civil enforcement is very difficult to do. Um, one thing that we have thought about is if um, the use of the property could be regulated through a, a land restrictive covenant agreement. So if you had an ADU approved, we could also as a city require a restrictive covenant be recorded against the property that would describe how the ADU can be used. So it could both require owner occupancy, it could also require a prohibition on short-term rentals. Um, and then the enforcement could be an action by the city or you could actually also allow as a separate remedy enforcement by third parties. So if you wanted neighbors or someone else to try to be able to enforce this to sort of maintain the uses in their neighborhood, um, that could be a right that you could give in a restricted covenant type agreement. If your objective is to make sure that they are maintained as housing units, right, and not short-term rentals, then the owner-occupied requirements supports that because there's more accountability on site by the owner who might be more invested. And I think that came up in the last 
discussion. Um, you have someone present that like the restrictive covenant could be enforced against. Um, and it might be more significant to an individual as compared to someone else on site or a, a corporate ownership. So that I think further enhances the, the use of a restrictive covenant as an enforcement tool. We, I, I also know that um, civil enforcement is looking at increasing daily fines, although those have not been effective thus far against short-term rentals. Katie? Hi there, I just wanted to <clears throat> add one other comment. This is Katie Lewis, the city attorney. Um, another comment to the idea of the restrictive covenant, and that is that because it's a cont contractual agreement between the person who's constructing the ADU and the city, you could also add a provision that a prevailing party who enforces the restrictive covenant could be entitled to attorney's fees. So that's a, also an, another enforcement tool for either the city or the third party to enforce on whatever conditions the city put in, either or both owner occupancy and a prohibition on short-term rentals. So that's just something to think about in terms of an additional compliance tool outside of code enforcement. Okay. So if I'm understanding this discussion correctly, this would be an additional thing not yet included in the transmittal. It's in the code. It's in which code? It's in the proposed code, restrictive covenant under section P. For it says or it includes a statement that the ADU can only be used and occupied in accordance with the applicable regulations. So So it's already in the code that the restrictive yep. covenant would be for short term rentals and currently for owner occupancy. That's correct. Is there other restrictive covenants that are included? So uh, they have to um, describe the ADU. So uh, that's the location, the size, how off street parking is allocated. They have to demonstrate, they would include compliance with all of the ADU regulations and any other regulations that are required in the code. And then it's recorded against the title of the property of the Salt Lake County Recorders. And office. does that do the thing with the attorney's fees that Katie was mentioning? That, that part is not in the code. Yeah. And probably also it would be important to clarify that the restrictive covenant could be enforced by either the city or a third party, as as Kimberly mentioned. If that, that that's a big that's a policy discussion yeah, for you seems all like to it's have, open to because that you know that does allow neighbors to enforce against neighbors in a different way than maybe we had done before. But it also um, creates an opportunity for for people to enforce without the compla complaint based code enforcement that we do now that, as you all council members have discussed, there's some dissatisfaction with. Mm -hmm. So attorney's fees and the third party enforcement might be things you, you might want to consider. Mr. Chair. Yeah, go ahead, council member, please. I have a follow up to that. Um, so, so hypothetical, so don't freak out. Let's say, um, let's say this council decides to remove the condition of unoccupied, but we do have this uh, um, uh, mechanism to uh, enforce uh, that you just suggested with the attorney fees and the you know neighbors enforcing uh, on the short-term rental. Wouldn't that allegedly also try to solve the problem of, which is I think an agreement of all of us, right? Short-term rentals is something that we don't like. I mean, uh, we don't want the city to turn into a short-term rental center, right? So wouldn't that by itself also be a, a mechanism to protect uh, this from becoming all short-term rentals? I think that's a great question and, and probably one for you all to explore because there is a difference with owner occupancy and somebody who is right there on the property. Uh, and that may be a difference from a corporation that is operating a property as a short term rental and builds the costs of those types of attorney's fees cases into the cost of doing business. So there may be a different business case when it's a corporation or a business than if it's an individual owner who lives on the property. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, I do have a follow-up to, to, to uh, so uh, thank you, Chris, for your questions earlier. I, I think I learned a lot even from that discussion, but is it true that this city downsized or, or downgraded basically our density in the 80s uh, or, you know, many, many councils before? 
Yeah, the, the city has a history of down zoning the city f going back to the first zoning ordinance in 1927. So the last time we did it comprehensively was 1995. So the city uh, was a little more dense until that point, and then they decided to go fa ba backtrack and like make it less dense. So that sort of proves, I think, to me that these things do evolve, and you know these things can go back. Um, there is a way of doing this back, and I think it's a policy question, regardless if it will be easy or not, or if it will be the appetite of this council or not. The tools are there. Now the question was, the, the, will the units be grandfathered in? And I think the, question, the answer to that is yes, right? It's hard to force them to change something that they already built. Now, something that I have a question a little more is on the enforcement. Like, you know, I think it was mentioned here a few minutes ago that it was very hard to enforce already, as it is right now. So my argument is, and part of it is, keeping something that we can, we have already a very hard time enforcing, uh, it seems, I, I'm struggling with that idea. So not only, you know, not only with, with this exchange of questions was useful to me to, to understand that, yes, zoning changes, mm -hmm. and we have done up and down many times before, but I also want to expand a little more on, on these enforcement tools that we have that we are really not enforcing as good as we should or we could uh, for whatever reason. Um, so it was mentioned that it was hard to enforce. So it, wouldn't there be an argument, a policy argument, I guess, for us to debate um, that keeping a rule on the books just cause it pleases or you know answers to some of our concerns, but then we cannot really enforce them, um, you know, with code enforcement because or we're, with the tools that we have, isn't that somewhat true? Am I making sense with what I'm trying to say? I'm going all over the place, uh, but I, I heard a few minutes ago that some of the code, some of the owner occupancy requirements right now are very hard to enforce. Well, it's actually short-term rentals short -term are rentals. really hard to enforce against because state law doesn't allow you to use advertisements on a short-term rental website as the sole evidence for enforcing against a short-term rental. So we can't just go on a website, search up places, and then show up and try to enforce against them. You have to have some other evidence, um, which normally probably comes down to like an affidavit from somebody who can say that there are people renting it on a short-term basis. So for example, we have had complaints, civil enforcement goes to the door, the tenant opens it and is like, yeah, I've just rented this for three days. There, there, then we have some evidence, right? Um, and even then though, the businesses that run short-term rentals might, as Katie mentioned, they might just take those fees it, I like as part of the cost of doing business and they maybe are making enough money that they don't care about the daily fee. And that's our tool that we have with civil enforcement. So that there's a couple of different reasons that we, that it, they're difficult to enforce against. Um, one other tool that I didn't mention that I, if you don't mind, I'll share is we don't currently have enforcement um, remedies through business licensing for um, units that might be used differently than how they're supposed to be. So if, it's, if a unit is being used as a short-term rental now, there is not a remedy of enforcement through business licensing. It's only through um, civil enforcement. And so one idea that I've also heard is if we created new ADU licensing fees, that there might be a way to use those to encourage compliance as well with whatever the conditions are that you set. And that would just, you're just saying that would be new. It, you're not saying anything about the potential effectiveness of it, correct? Correct. It's something we just haven't tried It's just yet. something okay, we don't have you. now. But it, it is theoretically legal per state code. Right, it would have to be cost justified. Correct. But we don't have a specific business licensing fee right now that's just specific to ADUs. So I think it's worth taking a step and just going through some of the options that have been raised so the public knows these, we're kind of talking about all the things that we've raised, but I don't know that we've stated them for people that are listening. Um, but the options related to the owner occupancy are listen to the staff report, A, remove the requirement altogether, B, the option to require construction of the ADUs to be owner occupied, and that that remains for a period of one year with an option, and I, it could be whatever period we choose, but the option to then remove that restriction 
after a year of un, of no substantiated zoning or civil enforcement complaints, um, there's an option that which could be combined with either option A or B, which is to require a business license fee to offset the cost of enforcement and require commitment not to use the ADU as a short-term rental. So for any landlord using an ADU as a rental, um, they there would be ADU as any rental. It must be long-term because we would not allow short-term, but doing so would be uh, subject to cost justification, of course, there's two fees that have been thrown out there, $1,000 a year, as I think a round number, or $2,400 a year, because that's about $200 a month, um, allowing owner-occupied properties to have that fee waived, and that fee could not be waived by the good landlord program. So this would be separate than the typical fee that rentals are being charged, be, and that would be something that would be charged to... Um, non-owner occupied, but could be waived. The item D is a sunset clause for owner occupancy requirement within the code. So saying we'll keep the owner occupancy requirement, but absent council action, that would sunset in 24 months. So the council would have two years, the city would have two years to sort of see what happens. And if it's bad, then the council would have to take action in order to, or sorry, yes. No, I guess it could go either way, right? We remove it. And then it, yeah, no, this one would be that it stays and then in two years it gets removed unless the council says, no, we want to keep it. Um, and then let me just get through the last one. Uh, the last item E is potential ideas that may be related to owner occupancy reconsideration uh, are a couple of the other straw polls that for some council members, it may be more palatable to change this if some of the other ones are reconsidered, which are the ones that may have been brought up are half mile within the designated bike lane for the parking and then removing the increase from a thousand feet going back to 720 feet. So I just wanted to like get that out there so that everyone's oh. aware kind of the things we're talking about. Hermano, do you mind if I just throw out the fee section there is just an idea, just, just to make sure idea. that clear. Absolutely. It's not like something we've weighed in as yes, this structure of a fee legally works. Absolutely, yeah. Councilman Fowler. Thank you, and thanks for kind of orienting us to what we're talking about here with some of these options. I think we all recognize the the not so elephant in the room that we're not, but is that this requirement of owner occupancy. So I just wanted to kind of give some of my thoughts here. I want to start with option C and the, the business license fee. One of the things that I keep hearing from council members um, as we've like debated this in different areas is that any, particularly as it relates to the owner occupant requirement, is that this creates too big of a barrier for anyone to build an ADU. Well, wouldn't $1,000 a year or $2,400 a year also create a huge barrier for anyone to build an ADU? And if what we're looking at is, is, is knocking down those barriers so that people can build ADUs, I don't, I don't understand that that logic there. I certainly do understand the logic of um, maybe increasing compliance fees, and I particularly, and I want to thank um, Katie and Kimberly for pointing this out, um, I, I truly like the idea of the restrictive covenants, right, and sort of having that as that option and going back to something Katie said, when we do have the owner occupant requirement, I think there is more incentive to comply because probably a lot of people aren't thinking, oh, I better like save away for those attorney's fees, especially if we add in the attorney's fees, right? Mm -hmm. But I better save away for those attorney's fees because of I'm not going to comply. I think it's different than that, right? It, it kind of creates, it's a deterrent to non-compliance that I, I think is one of the other things that I keep hearing is how do we enforce these things? Well, it's in the ordinance that we could enforce these things, right? That it's, it's there and, and there's a contract and basically it's a breach of contract that then we can go after somebody and, and kind of make them get into compliance in one way or another. 
Whereas, again, as Katie and, and Kimberly brought up, if it's a corporation, which we're seeing a lot of, and I think this is why this owner-occupant requirement for right now is so important to me, is we are seeing a lot of corporations come in and buy, buy properties, and, and they probably are thinking, like, they actually are the ones thinking, I better put away attorney's fees into my bank account. I mean, they have that as a business, right? Um, and so... I just, um, those are some thoughts on those two. And I, I, I look at this like sunsetting idea or the, and I just think to myself, you know, we passed the ADU. I don't think that we need it. I think it seems sort of, I don't know, in some ways just weirdly redundant in the sense that we passed the ADU ordinance two years ago, three years ago, 2018. And, oh, it's been that long. Mm, how time flies. But um, when we passed that, we said, let's come back and look at it. We required planning to come back and say, hey, give us an update on how this is going because we, we know this is going to evolve. So instead of then sort of in this roundabout binding a future council, which is what I think that kind of does without really doing it, it kind of does. Um, we could actually just say, hey, planning, come back and give us another update in three years, and then we can decide if we want to remove this, which we do all the time. We have reporting requirements for every department in the city. Um, and, and then we're not like putting the cart before the horse, which is what we're kind of, what I think that that sunset clause does. And again, I think it binds a future council. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I recognize and I've had lots of discussions with all of the council members that, um, you know, we want more density, we want more of these things, but I think that it's okay to say, let's, and I've heard council members say this too, well, you guys are the experts, so I'm gonna do that. But it seems that we only do that when we agree with the experts that's sitting at that table. and. <laughs> which is fine, but um, in this case, like we've asked them to go through this very complicated situation, a uh, very complicated ordinance, very complicated zoning, and say, what are your best ideas for making this ordinance better than it was five years ago? And that's what, and that, I, I, I believe that's what has happened here, especially with the community engagement and, and kind of looking at this from a holistic way. And I mean, my my preference would just be to say let's just pass it as the planning gave it to us um, for all of the reasons that we've all talked about over and over again and then and then say hey planning come back and talk to us in two years we're talking so specific to the owner occupancy right because we've Not changed a lot the other things that we've i mean moved. the other things that we've changed yes but okay. so go ahead so thank you very much uh over the weekend, I reread all the comments from different people, kind of reviewed and walked backwards on where we were before I was in the council in 2018. And the discussion there was we knew ADUs was going to be a minor player in housing. We knew it wasn't going to be the uh, holy grail on housing. We knew it was going to be a small bit there. So, And we, we stepped into it, and we made it. For the external, we made it uh, conditional use, not permitted. And then we had some restrictions there. And we noticed that there was also a, a, a small number of uh, ADUs built. And, and now we're going forward, we're, we have this rush to build more affordable housing and more, more housing across the board and more density. And we have a lot of initiatives coming down the pike, a lot, a lot of bigger initiatives coming down the pike. And I, and I still look at this ADU as a small sliver of that uh, housing uh, uh, addition and the condition the uh, the complaints I've heard all the time were the conditional use is expensive and timely timely for the owner and it's expensive and timely for the planning commission and a hundred percent of them are approved so we went back to the drawing board we have a new uh, amendment here and it removes the permitted it changes excuse me, it removes the conditional and makes it all permitted. And I thought, that's great. 
but there was, and there were some conditions, there were some concerns about the size and the setbacks and everything else, but, it, and, uh, and it also kept the owner occupancy, which was also vitally important, because we, everyone's comment was owner occupancy was the number one comment, and then there was other comments behind that. And so when I, when I stepped back from it, I said, oh, we also added a lot more zoning, uh, areas that are now ADU approved so that the whole city is is uh, available for ADUs except for manufacturing and some other small spaces or industrial areas so we've we've broadened the field for ADUs uh, and I and I step back and say so for the concerns for the single-family zoned areas I'm looking at going why don't we keep what we have it really, we're removing the per permitted side, or excuse me, we're adding the permitted side. Keep that size. We can look at, see how it's going on the single family house. And on the additional sides, the uh, commercial use areas, the multifamily use areas, allow for the additional size, allow for the different setbacks, because those lots are also uh, predominantly larger in scope. I'm not sure if you can legally do that, but that's how I'm, I'm looking at this. I, I like the idea that it's owner-occupied. I want to make sure that we keep the owner-occupied side, especially for the single-family homes. And as, as you mentioned, Nick, single-family homes, uh, even on a multifamily lot, would have to be owner-occupied, which I didn't understand that uh, you know, an hour or two ago. So I appreciate that discussion. So I'm, I'm almost looking at it as two different things. The single-family residencies, uh, keep what we have. The multifamily commercial residencies will take what the, the the amendment says here, which is additional size and different size, because that's also probably larger lots. So, I, I just want to say it's it's not true that all of the comments said that the owner occupancy requirement should stay. The whole reason we're here and having another I, another. I apologize. You're right. Period. You're right. There, there was, because the public hearing. You're correct. Was convincing I, to several I, I apologize. council members that we should cons reconsider that. I so. apologize. You're right. There was, uh, I would say, owner occupancy was one of the uh, was one of the a main topic. But whether you keep it or not keep it was the topic. So correct. yes, I apologize. You're right, Councilmember Pui. Mr. Chair, so thank you. I I'm going to restate since uh, you know my values on this, and I this, and I shifted uh, through the process, uh, and I'm sh constantly shifting. And the only times. Uh, I didn't engage. It was because there was a, some sort of wall uh, on this discussion, right? And I, we've been trying, and I think this proves to the to the public that this council has been debating this, uh, actual debating this, trying to find an answer uh, to the questions from the community. Um, to me, this comes back to housing uh, and the ability of housing, and to me, the emergency that we have in our city as far as housing and uh, and, and the lack thereof. I think uh, now, when we're talking about minor playing on how it'll be, this being a minor player, um, it's because of the barriers that, that, that we have. Not only the, the barriers that we have, but we're adding to those barriers, right? Like the cost is one of them, right? So. Um, I also want to uh, reiterate some of my concerns about this discussion. Renters and many of the people that commented, you know, and I, I try to address all of them, uh, even to so they know that I acknowledge the comment. Uh, it is hard sometimes when you have like two or three hundred emails uh, in a couple of days, but uh, the, you know, this wouldn't affect many parts of our city as much as other parts of our city. Uh, it is a fact. You know, your district or, or parts of your district are to like 78, 80 percent uh, owner occupied. Uh, you know, much like, you know, sugar house parts of, parts of the district, there are 70 some percent, 80 percent parts of that are owner occupied uh, areas of the city. Um, and these policy changes are going to affect least, the least amount, those parts of town. It doesn't mean that there are illegitimate concerns. There are legitimate concerns. The parking issues, the short-term rentals, the absentee landlords are all very legitimate issues that I want to solve, and I think everybody is here is committed to solving. But I think we are changing, we are trying to address these problems through zoning. And these problems are no zoning problems. Right? I think we need to solve those problems with enforcement, with some other tools that we have on, on the tool, uh, on the on the toolbox. So I 
Uh, I think that our scare, our main main scares are, you know, if I want to summarize some of you, and I might be missing some, is short-term rentals. Yes, I agree. We are very limited with short-term rentals and the enforcement of such. Uh, and you know, maybe there is something there that we need to we can do to cut it. Many of the complaints from the neighbors were are related to sound parking and absentee landlords, like houses that look like crap, right? Uh, we need to enforce our code, so we need to put more money into that and and actually beef it up. So many of the concerns I keep hearing are not relating to the zone, they're relating to the effect of this zone and the effect of these changes. And we are not doing a good job at that. And that was my what I tried to do earlier is to try to address those issues before this conversation. That's what I wanted to add those two people into. And I think this comes from my debate this and I think I'm very excited. But um, also in previous conversations we it was said the market created this housing crisis. The market didn't create this housing crisis by itself. Zoning and our city also added to this by downsizing our zones. So we are creating this housing market, uh, this crisis that we have, and we have a tool here that could help. Uh, now, we are really uh, scared about the, hy the hypothetical uh, a a ADU that turns out into a really bad uh, into a really bad housing unit with with parties, and I will freak out too, right? Parties and lots of parking and, and very bad taking care of yards. And that is something that we really need to address. Um, but I think that we really need to see this as a tool uh, to create gentle density in all parts of town, including, including in areas of, of, of the city that are not getting any density. So that's what I stand on this issue. Mr. Chair. Council Member Petro already asked to make a comment. There are so many places to start right now. <laughs> um, yeah, so I would like to reiterate, I, I'm one of the people who the last public comment session introduced information to me and data to me that I had not opened myself to. My instinctive place to start on this is that ADUs are useful for families who need income streams to stabilize their own housing situation and for families who want to live multi-generationally, multi either caring for older family members, high college students, things like that. However, the last comment session allowed me to see that that was a very personalized view into this topic. And in fact, we have a study that demonstrated that we have a housing supply crisis, not just for the deeply affordable that we've all been focusing on, but for people living at 80% AMI to 125% AMI. And so diversifying our stock and accelerating that is something where ADUs could potentially come in and start being useful. So in that vein, we, I, I would love to thank Councilmember Puy for demonstrating. We are not keeping up with growth, and that is a Salt Lake City tradition. We downzoned at a time where now causes us to have less naturally afford occurring affordable housing than other areas. We don't have to repeat history's mistakes, and it is possible that we don't have to repeat the mistakes of other markets who have gone ahead on this. I hear what Council Member Fowler is saying. However, we could argue that any ordinance is binding, binding future councils and therefore we shouldn't pass any of them. By passing an ordinance that would allow us to move forward, allow the staff in the city to acclimate to the things that we know will work for us, but allow us the full power of the tool potentially should we continue to experience this level of housing deficit, given criteria that we could set, we could be smarter, we could be the people who craft the policy and make the policy work for us instead of us always having to catch up to the policy. We could set criteria that help us understand if we need to remove the owner occupancy. Because in two years, I'm hoping that we're dealing with the issues that come before us in two years. I do not hope we're relitigating the things that we relitigated the first time seven years ago by the time it gets in front of us. We could save staff time. We could move forward. If you think our enforcement is overworked, you should see our permitting pr program. You should see our planners. You should see the other people who are working routinely in excess of 60 hours a week just to keep up with our basic growth trajectory. We could be smarter than the ordinance. We could be the creators of it and the shapers of it and offer ourselves the full power of the tool 
in addition to the full power of protections from what has gone wrong in other markets. I would prefer to see us do that. I concede Council Member Wharton's con issue, which he very generously came to speak to me about in his own personal time, that we don't have Salt Lake City specific data. We can give ourselves the lead time to get that and create triggers. We could put a trigger in there that says if there's not enough red ADUs, we can't, we will not remove owner occupancy. We can do that. And we can not cause staff to have to spend their time going over a seven year old issue and allow our city to move forward with growth trajectories if indeed in two years it's proven that we've been able to enforce, we've been able to maintain what we committed to maintaining, and that it is absolutely relevant for us. If it's not, scrap it. But let's please be a little efficient. Let's, let's look for a growth trajectory that we can actually get ahead of. I, I wanted to add to, the, two weeks ago we heard the mid point update on the new five-year housing plan, and that indicated that we have about 5,500 lacking units that are 30% below. We actually have a surplus of 30 to 50 and 50 to 80% AMI units. The issue is we have a huge lack of market rate units. We have 100 to 125, we're missing 2,000 units. Over 125, we're missing 5,493 units. And so those people that, are, that need those market rate housing units are taking over the, the naturally occurring affordable housing at the 30 to 80% AMI level. So the people, so there's a huge need for those. So adding market rate housing will help solve our housing issue. I don't I would be surprised if there's anyone up here that thinks we have enough housing in our city. I would also be surprised if there's anyone up here that knows of giant swaths of land that are undeveloped that make sense for us to build roads and add sewer infrastructure to to make a whole bunch more. We're out of land in this city. And the, the land that we have, this ordinance allows us to unlock the land that is currently locked up in backyards that are doing nothing but taking water. And I understand that the fee idea and things like that will not create affordable ADUs, but ADUs are already very, very expensive. Another thing we should discuss is ADU incentives. So financing or pre-designed pre plans, pre-approved plans and things that will make ADUs less expensive. That's a, oh. a different discussion that we need to have and we should have because that's the only way that ADUs will ever hit any level of affordability. But ADUs being rented out at market rate still helps our solve our housing crisis by reducing the demand on those more naturally occurring older affordable housing units. And so that's where I think adding a fee to those, yes, that's that's making it more expensive for those, but we that's okay because we're accepting that owner, non-owner occupied units will become a market rate unit. They will not be an affordable unit. And that's already the case unless we invest our dollars into that, which we should do in a different program. But I think opening up this tool so that it can create housing at all levels. And we know that it's just expensive to build an ADU. You're building four walls and a roof and a foundation. That's going to be expensive. So no matter what, absent us financing it, these are going to be market rate units. I think adding the fee, making it maybe slightly above market rate, still hitting whatever the market, you know, but I think adding that fee and then using that to help offset our enforcement costs solves all of the, the concerns to me, but I know it doesn't solve everyone's concerns. Councilman Fowler. Thank you. Um I just wanted to, if, if I may go back to something you said, Council Member Bowie, and that's that this, the argument about, you know, certain areas having a high um, home ownership percentage and that this taking away the, the owner occupied requirement wouldn't affect those. But I was sitting here thinking about that. And I mean, I rent my house in the, this area. And I think taking away that that owner occupied requirement for an ADU actually could very much affect home ownership in these areas that have a current high percentage of home ownership. Because what's the incentive for, for 
I mean, because I think it can create that incentive of, man, I can sell my house to these people that want to create all these create ADUs for renters and go buy a house in, you know, well, there's nowhere inexpensive right now, but go buy, go buy a house in Ogden that, and, and move and, and have more affordability and more space. And then what I think that has the potential of doing is increasing everybody's rents, right? And we already can't, I mean, the rents in Sugar House are like stupid ridiculous. And so, it, I worry that, that that argument actually backfires a little bit because you're creating an incentive, you have the potential of creating an incentive for people to sell their houses, which would increase potentially, again, the renter market at a much higher rate, which is exactly what we don't want to do philosophically with the ADUs. Um, and then I think that um, the, I had another comment in my head, but it was really snarky, so I'm not going to say it. Um, Can, but not, I'm not, not I'm going to leave it there. All right. We, it's 6.38, and we still have board appointments to get to. It, and dinner. Mr. Chair, <laughs> I would like, I just want one minute so that p the public knows where I'm Go standing. Ahead. And I think. Um, I haven't said anything, so I, think I have that's not fair. said anything. And, and, and the reason why I have not said anything, because I'm still analyzing and I'm still hearing my peers' um, um, argument. And I, you know, I see the, ADU, the biggest obstacle for ADUs and the reason why we haven't had any is the, the price point. Uh, the owner occupancy, you know, yeah, it, it would solve a lot of things. Um, but I think um, the price point is what's Keep, is, was keeping us behind. And, and I was trying to lobby and I'm thinking about this, perhaps, um, you know, perhaps it, it's a, maybe we have to be a little bit bolder about um, about how to incentivize this. Maybe it's something financial that the city could work on to actually make these ADUs happen. Because I think, regardless of what we decide, owner occupied sizes, whatever, we're going to come back in two years and we're going to see two ADUs being built and all of this discussion, and all of this work, um, it's for nothing, and we're back to square zero. So. For the public, I'm in the middle. I, I, I see everything. I just want to be a, li a little bit bolder about how to go about ADUs. Um, I'm, you know, I am, I want everything that everybody has said, and um, we're, I'm still debating more of like, do we have a sunset or do we just have a legislative intent? We're going to rediscuss the owner occupancy um, in, in two years. So. I hope that I Thank hope you, that's clear. Uh, that's all I have to say for now. Baltimoreos. Yeah. I I'm going to get daggers. I think <laughs> you're all going to be really mad. But we have a pretty short agenda next week. We have a public hearing, a second public hearing scheduled for this on the 21st. I, I don't think our discussion is done, so I would propose that we rediscuss this on the 14th. Prior to for the public listening, please come give us your thoughts on the 21st um, with potential action that night or at a future time. Okay. Can I still make my comment? <laughs> we have 20 minutes left and we have another, another discussion next week. So sorry to the board appointees that are here, but thank you for staying. Um, we're moving on to item 10, which is an, a board appointment for the Arts Council, Hannah Nielsen. I'll just ask all the board appointees to come forward um, to save a little bit of time. Item 11 is a board appointment to the Human Rights Commission for Pamela Silberman. And item 12 is a board appointment to the Human Rights Commission for Will Terry. So if you are here in person, please come to the table. If you're here online, I see someone has joined. Uh, which one is Hannah? Hi, I'm Hannah. Hannah, thank you for being patient and bearing through our discussions. Um, and thank you for volunteering to serve on the Arts Council. Take a minute or two and just introduce yourself, why you're interested in this uh, position and why you're willing to spend your free time for the city. <laughs> yeah, so my name is Hannah Nielsen. I'm currently the Creative Program Manager at the Leonardo Museum downtown. So I'm pretty close to you guys right now anyway. Um, I got my a uh, bachelor's degree from Brigham Young University in illustration, my master's degree in painting and drawing from the University of Utah. My entire focus professionally and personally is in 
spreading arts knowledge throughout the public and encouraging opportunities for the public to engage with art. One of my favorite things that I do here at the museum is operate the residency program that we do in partnership with artists and make in Utah, and it's so rewarding. So I'm really in love with what the Arts Council does, all of the wonderful opportunities they provide to the public to interact with art. And I'm very interested and excited about the possibility of working with them and being a part of this. So. Thank you, Hannah. Council members, any questions for Hannah? Thank you so much for being willing to serve the community. You're going to be on our consent agenda. You do not need to join the meeting, um, but you will be confirmed as part of our consent agenda. Thank you. Thank you so much. The next is Pamela Silberman for the Human Rights Commission. I hope I got that right. Please correct me if I didn't. That's, you got it correct, thank you. Okay, go ahead and introduce Great. yourselves and so, why you're interested yeah, in the Human Rights thank Commission. thank you. Um, my name is Pamela Silberman, and I've lived in Salt Lake City um, for 27 years. And um, professionally, I've worked um, with refugees and immigrants and vulnerable populations pretty much in the nonprofit sector my entire career, and very committed to social justice and um, equity in our community. I served for seven years on the CDCIP board, which I loved and had a great experience, and then stepped off of that um, a couple of years ago when I, my term was finished. Um, so I was looking for another opportunity to serve my community and saw the opening on the Human Rights Commission and feel like it really fits well with um, my work and my beliefs and my values. And so I would love to have that opportunity. Thank you, Pamela. Council members, any questions or comments for Pamela? Thank you so much for being with us, sir. You'll be confirmed during our consent agenda. You do not need to attend. And last, Will Terry, also for the Human Rights Commission. Thank you guys so much for having me here today. So my name is Will Terry. Um, I I'm a born Utah native. I was born in Salt Lake City. I love this city. Utah is my home, but Salt Lake City is where I feel at home. Um, I currently work as the political action coordinator at Equality Utah. Um, for those who aren't aware, we are the state's leading LGBTQ, um, LGBTQ um, advocacy organization. And I work, I've kind of attended some of the meetings um, on the Human Rights Commission, and I've seen the work that's being done, and I'm really interested um, in being a part of that and kind of learning more about how policy is enacted on a city level um, and just kind of what that process looks like. So thank you guys for your consideration. Thank you, Will. That sounded like a really good political speech, just saying. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, thank you for what you're doing with Call of Utah. Council members, any questions? Seeing none, thank you. You'll be confirmed during our consent agenda. All right, with that, we are to report of chair, vice chair, and I have none. Thanks, vice so chair has none. Uh, executive director, none. Which, <laughs> and there is no closed session, correct? So we are adjourned. We will be back for our public meeting at seven o'clock. Eat quick. Seven, yes, I think that's fair. Seven ten. We we went a little bit long. Sorry, we'll eat quite, as quick as we can. And Mr. Chair, if I could just mention that we'll have overflow set up in the chamber. Okay, thank you. There, there's overflow seating in the chamber if anybody cannot fit in the, in the work, in the room here.